number 10 spot, we have Ring Avulsion, all right? If you're a Jimmy Fallon fan, you might remember a few years ago when he took a couple weeks break from the show, and when he came back, he clearly had a hand injury, which he explained was, of course, the reason for his absence. What had happened is that Jimmy experienced Ring Avulsion. This horrible thing is an injury that occurs when you're wearing a ring on your finger and it catches on something or somehow creates so much pressure that it severely damages the soft tissue on your finger. And what I mean by severely damages is that it can basically like almost take your finger off without really taking it off, if you know what I mean. Or or it can like deglove it, where it's basically like skinned. Either way, it's absolutely terrible. And while Jimmy turned it into a great story, it's definitely not a pretty sight and a Google search could bring about some pretty gruesome image results. In our number nine spot today, we have pressure cooker backpacks. This one is gonna be pretty self-explanatory, but someone learned the hard way that the combination of Googling the words pressure cooker bombs and then backpacks is one that no one should dare. In 2013, a Suffolk County man Googled these things and the police later showed up to his house. I mean, yeah, it's definitely a strange combination of things to Google one after the other, but in case it isn't just a coincidence, I'm glad someone is looking out for these kinds of things. In the end, after some investigation, the police were able to determine that there was no threat and that the man was just feeling a little curious that day. I'm sure, he also learned a very valuable lesson and likely regrets his search history. In our number eight spot today, we have insider trading. Listen, I don't know anything about trading or stocks or anything like that, but I have learned to never Google the words insider trading in an international account. Someone else made this mistake and ended up paying the consequences. Back in July of 2017, MIT researcher Fei Yan ended up being arrested after he Googled that phrase and then allegedly purchased a bunch of stock. The arresting charges were three counts of fraud because federal prosecutors claimed that this stock that was purchased made him $120,000 in illegal profits. Apparently, this guy was using information that was obtained through his spouse's job, which gave illegal insight into certain trading options in order to make these trades, but not before Googling how to avoid law enforcement while doing it and a bunch of other things that created quite a clear timeline for authorities during the investigation. I guess this search is okay should you not be planning to follow through on the illegal insider trading, but it's probably best just not to Google it at all, just to be as safe as possible. You don't want the police showing up at your door like the other guy. In our number seven spot today, we have the FDA Defect Levels Handbook. Each year, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, they release a report that details something that, honestly, I want to remain blissfully ignorant about. This report details what the maximum levels of different horrible things are that are legally allowed to be in the food that we all eat. What I mean by horrible things is stuff like rodent hairs, maggots, you know, stuff you really don't want in your food at all because what in the actual world that's horrible? For your own sanity, this is a good search to stay away from, but if you're one of the people who is just way too curious to stay away from it, just remember that I tried to warn you. I mean, personally, I don't want to know how many bugs are allowed to be in my food. I just don't think I could handle it, okay? In our number six spot today, we have Crocodile. This is the nickname that is used to describe desomorphine, which is a morphine derivative that has some extremely strong effects. This illicit substance, unfortunately, has found its way into the lives of those battling addiction, and it has absolutely wreaked havoc, and the results of its usage are truly terrifying. Unfortunately, much of the production of this this substance is illegal, which only leads to an increase in the negative impact it has on the users. The side effects of it often are due to certain toxic substances, which does what is referred to as cooking the skin. Definitely sounds completely horrible. It can also lead to large-scale tissue infection or even damage in the area where it was administered. In fact, the effects of this substance are so bad that many refer to it as the flesh-eating drug. It's safe to say this is definitely something that no one should do and probably Probably just don't Google it either. In our number five spot today, we have the Grizzly Tapes. Okay, you should never Google this because these videos should never be watched because this is something that should have never even been recorded. These tapes were the last thing left by Timothy Treadwell and his girlfriend. Timothy Treadwell was known as the Grizzly Man. He spent 13 years of his life going in and out of living with bears, which for the most part sounds like the most terrifying thing you could imagine, but for him, he wanted to show the world that you could live 
with bears and that they were not an animal to be feared. Well, even though he was able to spend over a decade in their presence, it's this living situation that would eventually lead to his death. Timothy was making a documentary about bears, so naturally he was spending quite a bit of time with them as he filmed. One day, while he was with a grizzly and filming for the doc alongside his girlfriend who was there to help him with the movie, the bear that they were interacting with ended up turning angry, frightened, or something happened that changed its behavior because it went on to kill both members of the couple as the camera rolled on. It's horrible. You can't see too, too much of what is happening, but you sure can hear it all, which is definitely bad enough. In our number four spot today, we have a jigger. When I hear this word, my mind goes to the bartending tool. It's like a shot measurer, okay? After I finish up my work here, I go to work at a restaurant. I see these things every week. They're my friend. If you were interested in perhaps purchasing some new barware, however, be careful with your search when using this term. While the tool is all fine and well, a jigger flea is nightmare fuel. These little insects with the same name as the trusty tool like to burrow into skin where they then lay eggs. Yeah, definitely don't want any images of that coming up in your search. I'm just trying to look out for you, really. Yeah, these small little parasitic guys are only one millimeter at first, and when they initially burrow into your skin, it might just feel like a little itchy or whatever. But as their abdomen swell with eggs, pressure can be created, and this pressure could press on nerves or blood vessels, which not only is just awful to think about, but can cause pain that ranges from mild to severe. All in all, just be careful what you Google, because not everything is what it seems. In our number three spot today, we have the Steve Irwin Stingray video. Like, how random, honestly. But don't Google it. Like, why? This one really gets me right in the feels. Steve Irwin, best known as the Crocodile Hunter, was famous for his wildlife interactions, but as many of us know, this passion for animals and an interaction with one in particular sadly turned deadly. On September 4th, 2006, Steve was taking part in the production of a documentary series, Ocean's Deadliest. That day, there was some not-so-great weather, which led to a bit of a pause in the filming. Since nothing was really going on, Steve decided to take a bit of a snorkel into the shallow waters nearby, and they filmed as he did this. He wanted to use the footage in his daughter's TV show, Bindi the Jungle Girl. As they swam in the water that day, Steve approached a stingray that was about two meters large, or six and a half feet, and he approached it from the back in order to try and get some footage of it swimming away. That is not what this stingray did, though. Instead, it propped on its front and started stabbing wildly with its tail as a defensive response. Unfortunately, this caused one of the barb pieces to pierce Steve's heart, which unfortunately led to his death. Despite the crew members administering CPR and rushing him to shore, there was just nothing that could be done. It is believed that this was the only fatality from a stingray that has ever been recorded on video. This is, of course, just tragic, but it also led to a bit of a war against stingrays afterwards. For weeks after his death, stingrays were being found on the beaches of Queensland with their tails cut off. No one is sure if this was done as an act of revenge against stingrays everywhere or what the case was. But uh, yeah, this is one video that don't Google. No one wants to see it. It's just terrible. It's sad. In our number two spot today, we have found in fast food. Of course, we have all heard tales of people making stuff up to try and get some kind of free food from their favorite fast food restaurants, but also there are some very real, very disturbing stories out there of stuff people have found, and it is all too searchable. If you searched things people have found in fast food, you'd be met with enough evidence to make you question every fast food meal you have ever and will ever eat in your life. People have found hardware parts, human skin, an entire rat, bugs, hair, and even a whole chicken head. I have a million questions, but I don't even want to attempt a Google search to find out the answers because I'm scared of what I might find out. Reading enough of these harrowing fast food tales is enough to ruin anyone's appetite. In our number one spot today, we have mouth larva. Pretty self-explanatory as to why you shouldn't Google this one, and I'm not even sure why anyone would. Maybe in an attempt to find moth larva information and there was a bit of a typo, but even then, maybe just stay away from Google that as well. Whatever reason you might be thinking of or accidentally typing mouth larva into the search bar, it's best to refrain from because this is one search that will just gross you right out. This search will definitely yield results of humans and other animals that have larva crawling in between their teeth. Yep, exactly what it sounds like, mouth larva. 
larva, and mouths. It's horrible, it's disgusting, and there's not only photos, but there's videos too, in case you wanted to get really weird. Just because you can Google these things does not mean you should. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have bot fly removal. Okay, we're starting off strong. Taylor and I used to watch this vet show a lot, and there were a lot of these on there, and let me tell you, it is not for everyone. If you're a fan of things like Dr. Pimple Popper, you might be able to stomach this one, but should that not be up your alley, this is a Google search to definitely stay away from. Bot flies are these pesky little flies that like to lay their egg in a host. The host, which can be human or animal, will have to deal with a horrifying fat, flesh eating bot fly maggot, which will later need to be removed from your skin. It is horrible. People will go to the doctor or take their animal to the vet because they noticed a strange bump. Little do they know, there is actually an entire maggot living in their skin. It's honestly disgusting. The, just the thought of it gives me chills. But there is relief at the end, which is always good. It's honestly just surprising to see the damage that these creatures leave behind. But you'll thank me later if you just don't Google it. It's one image I'll never be able to erase from my mind. In our number nine spot today, we have the Victor Sayenko video. Victor is just one part of a group that is responsible for a string of in Ukraine that took place in June and July of 2007. In the end, he was charged with 29 separate incidents, 21 of which were and the rest were incidents where the victims thankfully survived the horrendous attacks. Aside from just how extremely terrible this entire thing is, the case gained a certain notoriety because of the fact that there was actually a recording of one of these crimes that was leaked and found its way onto the internet. That is because the people committing these acts had intended to sell the videos of them being done, which is thought to have been the biggest motivation for the crimes. In the end, Victor was found guilty of all of these crimes and is currently serving a life sentence, but that video still lurks a there unfortunately on the internet and I think it definitely goes without saying that this is something that is just not safe for life. In our number 8 spot today, we have pillows under a microscope. This one may seem a little specific, but just you wait. Pillows are the thing we rest our weary heads on every night to get our 8 hours. Who am I kidding? Most of us are getting what? 4? Regardless of whoever sleeps the most or the least, our pillows all are going to be looking a little similar. The pillow seems so inviting, so warm, so cozy, it's a safe place. Right? Wrong. You get up close to that thing, view it under a microscope, and you reveal all the other things that also like to rest their little heads on it. Under a microscope, the common house dust mites that lurk on many of our pillows become alarmingly visible, and as we speak, there's probably more than you'd like to know living on yours. These guys like to live on your pillow because their favorite food is your dead skin cells. Yeah. It's disgusting. I'd appreciate it if they could at least do something to alleviate nightmares, but no, they just are the nightmare. In our number 7 spot today, we have feeding time at an eel farm. One day, on Reddit, I came across a video that was titled, Feeding Time at an Eel Farm, which I mean, is exactly what the video is. But man, I was not expecting it to look like this. As soon as they drop the food in, a bunch of freaky little water snakes immediately start jumping at it. But like, when I say a bunch, it's so much more than I could have ever expected. There is something about this video that really feeds into the whole fear of the ocean thing. And while this video is definitely oddly terrifying, it's also important to note the danger of these eel farms, especially for the kinds of eels that are endemic to an area, those that are endangered, or both. Eels are long living creatures who only breed once and they don't do it in captivity. When most of a generation of eels are caught, it proves to be a really large problem in terms of population. In our number six spot today, we have zombie ants. These infected creatures are so horrifying to me, they honestly are like nightmare fuel. There is a type of insect pathogenic fungus that is commonly found in tropical forest ecosystems. This fungus infects a certain kind of ant, and once infected, this ant basically turns into a zombie. Good news is, the ant doesn't suddenly go around eating others of its kind, but it is still being controlled and manipulated by this fungus. The ant will leave their nest and usual trails and head for the forest floor, which has better conditions for fungal growth. From here, the ant will then bite and attach itself to the major vein on a leaf, and basically they just stay there until they die, which is usually around 4-10 to 10 days. During these days, the fungus will basically start to sprout out of the ant's head, so as 
to be prepared to infect the next unsuspecting creature, and that is what Google will show you awful images of. Maybe it's because I hate bugs so much that this one disturbs me, but I don't know. It's just really unsettling. I get like Last of Us vibes from this one. In our number five spot today, we have Lamprey Eye Disease. I'll be totally honest and upfront with you. This is something that is not real and instead was a classic internet hoax, but that doesn't mean it wasn't based on a real thing, and it also doesn't mean that the very unsettling photoshopped photos of it aren't completely upsetting imagery. Basically, a lamprey is a real waterbound parasite fish that has ancient lineage here on Earth, and they also have the creepiest looking head in the world. So the people of the internet decided to create and spread news of this fake disease inspired by the real creature's weird head, and thus lamprey disease was born. And in my opinion, lamprey eye disease was the worst of all of the lamprey options. It's exactly what it sounds like, and basically a search of lamprey eye disease will reveal images of a person whose eye has been photoshopped to appear like the head of that parasite. While I can rest easy, knowing I'll never experience this in real life, there are some images that just should never exist, whether photoshopped or not. In our number four spot today, we have the 80s Kleenex commercial. There is a legend that suggests there is actually a curse surrounding this really weird and creepy Kleenex commercial that aired in the 80s. The commercial itself is very strange, and it depicts some sort of ogre child thing being sung to by a woman who is acting really strangely, and the song she is singing is also perfectly fit for a horror movie. The ad was quickly pulled from the air as it had people calling in explaining that they were really creeped out by it, but of course the internet took hold of it beforehand. So that creepy looking child I mentioned before, well many people believe that it resembles an oni demon. There are of course major consequences for looking at a demon, which is exactly what this urban legend surrounds. Basically, legend goes that the crew who worked in this commercial production ended up all passing away after working on the commercial, all in really mysterious ways, which people of course believe is due to the demon on set. All in all, I think these haunting tales are enough to have me staying away from googling it any further. In our number three spot today, we have The Island of the Dolls. The Island of the Dolls is basically exactly what it sounds like, and while it is exceptionally creepy to look at, the story behind it is even more disturbing. The island sits in the canals south of Mexico City and is the home of many, many absolutely terrifying and mutilated dolls. Even in the daylight, dolls look creepy with their missing limbs and heads and weird beady eyes, but at nighttime, the island is nightmare fuel. The story behind this island is very tragic. It starts off with the only person on the island, Don Julian Santana, finding a body. He was of course absolutely beside himself over this gruesome discovery, and shortly after, he saw a doll floating by in the water. He strung the doll up in a tree in order to appease her soul and to protect the island from evil. While this is an extremely dark story and the dolls are very, very creepy, I think we can all certainly understand why the dolls definitely needed to stay there. In our number two spot today, we have thrush. If you were searching this term, looking for a plump, soft plumaged, small to medium sized bird, you might want to be a little more specific. This is because just the general term might have Google confusing your harmless bird interest for something else. Thrush is also the term used to describe a certain infection caused by a yeast which is called candida. Candida lives on and in all of us, but sometimes Sometimes there can be a change that causes it to multiply, and this can cause an infection and an overgrowth. Thrush is seen when the fungal growth takes over the mouth, throat, or esophagus, and while this is not something that is uncommon at all, it definitely can be a bit surprising when you expected a cute little bird and instead got images of someone's esophagus. This is one Google search that you definitely need to be clear about what you're searching for, because who knows what results might show up. In our number one spot today, we have your symptoms. It really is the classic tale. You start having symptoms, whether common ones or not, and you take to the search bar to input those symptoms, hoping for some kind of an answer or perhaps a home remedy, and boom, you are met with the news. Your symptoms could only mean one thing, a rare terminal illness. I swear, according to Google, that is the answer every time. And to be honest, this could be quite dangerous in a multitude of ways. Firstly, the panic. It's 
it's always best not to send yourself into a downward spiral for no reason, and it is definitely true that a Google search is not the same as a real doctor visit. Now, I totally know that a doctor visit isn't always accessible to everyone, and sometimes we do have to rely on a bit of our own research to carry us through, but be wary of the results. Don't get too spooked at what you see come back, but if you do happen to get worried, it's always good to get a second opinion when you can. All right, guys, starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the inside of your stomach. I'm not entirely sure why anyone would want to Google this, but if you're curious about some of your intestinal anatomy, you perhaps are looking for a nicely colored diagram to learn more about what's going on in your own body, but unfortunately, that's not all that comes up on one of these searches. Googling the inside of your stomach will have some image results of, well, the inside of your stomach. What did you think? It's exactly what you asked for, but let me be clear. That is not a sight for everybody. Looking at these images would definitely make quite a few of us sick to our stomachs, unless you're a medical student or a professional, or just know that you can handle the graphic images that might pop up on the screen. This is definitely a search that should just stay out of your history. In our number nine spot today, we have crime scene photos. There unfortunately are many crime scene photos on the internet that are just one simple search away, but today we are talking about just one, and that is the Nikki Katsouris crash scene photos. In October of 2006, Nikki was 18 and driving her father's Porsche in Lake Forest in California when she unfortunately lost control of the vehicle and crashed. The crash is said to have been extremely gruesome, and like any crime scene, photos were taken of it. Unfortunately, these photos did end up getting leaked through emails, and from there they were posted to and spread on the internet. It has become abundantly clear that Nikki's family does not want people looking at these photos. So other than the fact that something like this is just not safe for life, I think they are making a perfectly reasonable request that definitely should be respected where possible. All this to say, I didn't and won't be googling any of these photos. In our number 8 spot today, we have the brain eating amoeba. Nigleria fowleri is more commonly known as the brain eating amoeba for a pretty fair reason, and this is one of those things that once you learn about it, it can kind of uh, send you down a rabbit hole. All right, we've all been there. This parasite is single cell and thrives in warm bodies of water. It can enter the human body when water that contains the amoeba enters the nose. It will then travel from there via the olfactory nerves, and within a few days, symptoms will begin to present themselves. The parasite can cause a brain infection known as meningoencephalitis, which can cause severe brain inflammation. How was that for a one time? Just one shot. Pretty impressive. That's a big word. Symptoms will start with a fever, a headache, some nausea and vomiting and a stiff neck. Eventually though, the symptoms will progress into lack of attention, loss of balance, seizures, hallucinations. The parasite will most likely put the host into a coma and almost 100% of the people who have been infected have lost their lives. This is all to say this terrifying parasite is one that I would refrain from googling unless you just want to be totally freaked out about its existence. I know I just told you about it, but don't google because it only gets worse from here. In our number seven spot today, we have the dark web. Just one of those really self-explanatory things. The dark web has stuff on it that we don't even want to begin to think about. And not only this, but just casually trying to access the dark web is likely to have you being added to some kind of internet watch list somewhere. A search for the dark web might reveal some odd conspiracy theories that might get you roped in. It might show you some horrific content you definitely don't want to see, or you might even see yourself getting hacked or a virus, or who knows, any of the other disgusting stuff that lurks on the dark corners of the internet. Who am I kidding? I feel like the dark web takes up more space on the internet than I want to know. All I'm saying is, hi, how are you? Let's all stay on this side of the internet, the fun, nice side, where we talk about creepy stuff, but we don't do creepy stuff. Know what I'm saying? In our number six spot today, we have Calculus Bridge. At first, I thought this was just like a terrifying math problem or something, but as it turns out, it really is just a dentist's nightmare. In the dental world, the word calculus means something very different. Basically, what dental calculus is, when you don't properly brush or floss dental plaque away, it can combine with the minerals that are in your saliva and eventually turn into calculus. While regular plaque can be brushed away, you definitely need professional help in order to get rid of calculus. Now, 
help calculus bridge is like a step up from regular calculus. According to Doctor of Dental Surgery Gary Schlotterer, quote, a calculus bridge occurs when tartar or calculus builds up so much that it connects with the adjacent teeth and forms a solid bridge of deposits. You can visually see this bridge due to its brown or tan color along the edge of the teeth by the gum line, but of course, when we Google this term, images is only going to show us some of the most severe cases, which can see the bridge extending into the gum line or further along the surface of the teeth. Unless you're particularly interested in dental hygienics, this might be a good search to just stay away from. In our number five spot today, we have a chicken laying an egg. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, I'm fairly certain it was the egg. We can discuss that all later because what we are discussing right now is why you should never Google a chicken laying an egg. I feel like this is hopefully pretty self-explanatory, but it's definitely a strange sight. You'd be surprised how much chicken egg laying content there is out there though. I mean, one of the top results when I searched this was a YouTube video called chicken laying an egg exclamation point. And then in parentheses, close up three, which I think insinuates a close up two and one, and I'm just gonna say it. Who needs three separate parts of close up shots? That's weird. Anyway, some things I think are better left to the imagination and some are best just not being thought of at all. And I think this counts as one of those. In our number four spot today, we have Ed Gein's house. Ed Gein was an absolute monster and is the basis for many horror movies today because of how horrifying his crimes were. Inside of his home, authorities found different household items that were made out of body parts, some from the victims of his crimes and some from the graves he would go and search and snatch from. There are some photos circulating the incident that are more tame, but some of them show just a drop of the horrors that lay inside of the home. For a while, for some unknown reasons, it was thought that they might use this house as a tourist attraction, but thankfully, the house ended up burning down, and honestly, I feel truly glad that it doesn't exist anymore. Save yourself the real life nightmare and just refrain from googling anything to do with Ed Gein, unless you want to see lamps made out of humans. In our number three spot today, we have historical Halloween costumes. In this day and age, when Halloween time comes around, we see all types of costumes. We see a few spooky, scary ones, but for the most part, we see princesses or fairies or basketball players or some sort of pop culture reference. But back in the day, Halloween was a terrifying time. And I'm not saying that because people dressed as these elaborate, scary creatures. I just mean the absolute scraps that people had to throw together to make a Halloween mask are truly scarier than any creature I could ever come up with. Googling Halloween costumes from history will bring up photos showing a nice little family as they're ready to celebrate the spookiest day of the year, but their costumes are full on terror inducing. It just gives me the strangers vibes. It's very unsettling. In our number two spot today, we have the wet koala. I love little koala bears. They're cute, they're always just chillin'. I feel like most people enjoy a nice photo of a koala, all right, brighten your day a bit. But for some strange reason, when you Google wet koala, everything changes. Wet koala searches bring back results of koalas that appear to be drenched in some sort of water. But for some reason, in all of these photos, the demeanor of the koala has changed. These wet koalas are not the nice, kind, cuddly, adorable ones I thought I knew, and instead are these angry, menacing, teeth-bearing ones that I really never expected to see. Okay. As it turns out, the teeth bearing one is actually all thanks to Photoshop, but I still stand by my original point. That Photoshop job really made me think of koalas in a different light, and the original photos they used to Photoshop still don't have the koalas looking too happy. Maybe they just aren't a fans of the rain, I don't know. In our number one spot today, we have eyelashes. In the last part of this video series, we talked about Googling your pillow under a microscope, and now we are talking about Googling your eyelashes under a microscope. Our eyelashes help keep our eyes clean and the stray ones give us witches and they seem like harmless little easygoing hairs, right? Well, turns out when we go a little closer, our eyelashes are the home to a disgusting little secret. The lashes aren't really the problem. The more concerning thing is the creatures that call them home. Mm-hmm. These creatures called demodex are mites that live on everyone's eyelashes. They, like the pillow bugs, feed off of dead skin cells as well as the oils that collect in the follicles. Okay, are you ready for the worst part? I know, it's crazy that we aren't even past it yet, but here we go. At nighttime, while you're sleeping, these guys come out of your eyelashes and head onto other regions of your face, and this is where they breed, okay? They then return to your lash follicles to lay up to 25 eggs. 
Yeah, I don't know. I woke up like just a couple hours ago and I'm still trying to recover from what just happened to me. All right, I don't like it. And we're starting things off with a, a weird one. Did you know that there is one instance of a person winning a race after they died? Frank Hayes was a horse trainer and jockey who in 1923 entered a race at Belmont Park Racetrack in New York. The horse was named Sweet Kiss, but got a new nickname after the race was over, the Sweet Kiss of Death, and it never raced again. And that's because midway through the race, Frank Hayes suffered a heart attack and died on his horse. But Sweet Kiss crossed the finish line and won the race. The folks went down to congratulate him, and that's when they noticed his body was slumped over. He was pronounced dead almost immediately. Hayes had been under tremendous pressure to cut weight for the race. Supposedly, he'd gone from 142 pounds to 130 in a very short span of time. Some articles even say he'd lost the weight in just 24 hours. I don't think that's possible. But regardless, he definitely lost it far faster than he should have. And number nine, we have helium. Apparently, Earth is running out of it. This is a bit of an issue because helium has a big role in various technologies. There's a growing demand for helium. It's used in MRI scanners, semiconductor manufacturing, and scientific research, and, and we're using it faster than it can be extracted. Helium is actually abundant in the universe, but it escapes Earth's atmosphere due to its lightness and uh, just migrates into space. As a result, our supply here on Earth is finite and non-renewable. Right now, researchers are exploring methods of helium production, like capturing it from the atmosphere, although that process is pretty costly and pretty challenging. I used to get really freaked out by stuff like this, but I don't know, now I'm just like, what am I supposed to do about it? Number eight, tersoriums. What is a tersorium, you ask? Well, this was a tool used in ancient Rome. He had a stick with a sea sponge on the end, looking a lot like a toilet brush. But these weren't used to clean inanimate objects. These were used to clean the rear end, basically toilet paper before toilet paper uh, existed. Now, this doesn't sound all that gross at first. Nothing wrong with using a sponge to clean your butt. But when you consider the fact that these things were shared in public restrooms, yeah, that's pretty revolting. Now, it would be dunked in a barrel of water and vinegar afterwards to clean it off, but I mean, still, not sure how effective that would really be. And even if it was, let's just say that vinegar cleansed the thing completely. Just the idea, the principle alone, of scrubbing your butt with something that who knows who else also used to scrub theirs. I don't care how supposedly clean it is. That should be for personal use only. I mean, just like your everyday loofah. All you do is scrub your body with that thing, parts of your body that are far more clean than back there, uh, and I still only want to use mine. So the idea of this uh, makes me sick. Let's stick around in ancient Rome for a bit, talking about their cure for epilepsy. Gladiator blood. Uh, it's pretty well known that gladiators were seen as these larger than life heroic figures, almost like superheroes of the time. And without any concrete medical understanding of epilepsy, it was believed that the life juice of a fallen gladiator would be drunk by someone suffering from the mysterious disorder to help cure them of it. This was most likely because gladiators were very strong and healthy, so drinking their red stuff uh, was believed to maybe be a bit of an elixir, consuming their life force to gain some of the strength that they had in life. Sometimes the gladiator's liver would be eaten too. Now, of course, this didn't actually work. I'm not sure how long this practice went on before they would have realized that, but maybe there was a bit of a ceremonial aspect to it as well. This one is pretty gross, but not all that shocking, to be honest. Like, who wouldn't want to consume parts of a super elite sports hero when they die brutally right in front of your eyes, right? We all wish we could do that. Number six. Genghis Khan. Uh, Genghis Khan helped the environment. Uh, ruling from 1206 to 1227, founded the Mongol Empire through conquests across Asia and Europe. His leadership united nomadic tribes and created a pretty vast empire stretching from China to Eastern Europe. He was absolutely brutal, responsible for the deaths of an estimated 40 million people. According to a study by the Carnegie Institution for Science Departments of Global Energy, he and his army's destructive massacres were so significant that they may have actually reduced the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. This is because areas used for farmland or land that was once populated by people was allowed to grow back 
into lush forests, eliminating carbon by 700 million tons from the atmosphere. Now, did Genghis Khan do this intentionally? Of course not, but it just goes to show that even when things look completely dark and messed up, I don't know, sometimes there's a bit of good that can come from it, I guess. And at number five, we have the Dancing Plague. The Dancing Plague of 1518 is a very bizarre event that occurred in Strasbourg, France. During the summer of that year, a woman known as Frau Trophy began dancing uncontrollably in the streets. She just wouldn't stop, and within days, other people started to like join in and eventually formed into this mass of dancers. This event lasted for weeks, with a number of participants growing to several hundred, and the dancers experienced exhaustion, dehydration, and some even died. Doctors were pretty puzzled by the situation, but determined it was caused by overheated blood and just sanctioned public areas for dancing to relieve the affected individuals. Nowadays, this is known as one of the most notorious cases of mass hysteria in history, an instance of mass psychogenic illness where uh, some kind of psychological trigger leads to physical symptoms in a large group of people at once. But even till this day, no definitive explanation has been reached as to how this started and what was really going on here. The story has always given me the creeps, though. I wonder what I would do in this situation, right? Would I just look at them all dancing and scratch my head and then continue on with my day? Or would I become afflicted and join in? That's the, that's the question. Number four, the Great Emu War. The American Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam. We've all heard of these and many more famous wars from throughout history, but there's one that doesn't get mentioned all that much, but played a significant role in the history of Australia, the Great Emu War. Yes, the Australian population raged a war with these flightless birds, and spoiler alert, they lost. The unusual event took place in Australia during 1932. Following World War I, soldiers were given land in Western Australia to start to farm, but because of economic hardships, many of these farmers found themselves struggling faced with crop destruction and land degradation caused by large populations of emus. The farmers requested assistance from the government, and in response, the government deployed soldiers armed with machine guns to help curb the emu population. And the war commenced in November of 1932, but proved to be more challenging than anticipated. The emus were quick and agile, and the soldiers found it difficult to and get rid of them. After weeks of this intense warfare, the government decided to just withdraw the troops. The emus survived the war relatively unscathed, and the campaign was deemed a complete failure. And at number three, we have the Green Children of Woolpit. This is a very bizarre tale. I, I'd never heard of this one before, and it was kind of a fun thing to read up on. The Green Children of Woolpit is a medieval legend that originated in the village of Woolpit, England during the 12th century. The story revolves around these two Two very odd young siblings, a brother and sister, who appeared in the village and, and they had green skin. They spoke in an unfamiliar language and wore strange clothing that the villagers weren't familiar with. They refused to eat food offered to them at first, but over time they started to adapt to their new environment and their skin gradually lost its green hue. They learned English and explained that they had come from a subterranean world where the sun never shined and everyone had green skin. They'd been uh, looking after their father's cattle, apparently, when they heard a loud noise and then suddenly found themselves in wool pit. And the brother eventually fell ill and died. Uh, the girl thrived, though, and went on to marry a man from the village and started a family. Uh, so where do you even start with a story like this? There are a lot of questions and only hypotheses about what actually happened here. One explanation is that the youngsters could have had some kind of condition that turned their skin green, right? Uh, perhaps they were migrants who were abandoned by their family and their language just wasn't known at the time. Of course, there are more outlandish theories though, like maybe they were from some long lost civilization that really did live underground. Some even speculate that they could have been an alien species from an alternate dimension. I mean, you, you know, just go nuts. Fun ideas, obviously there's nothing to really back that up. So all we know is that it's a very strange story from a very long time ago. And at number two, we have a type of fish with human looking teeth. So take a look at this. Uh, yeah, that's, that's real. 
Someone didn't just put a set of dentures into a regular fish's mouth as a joke. This is a sheep shed fish. It uses those teeth to chomp down on the shells of the creatures it eats, like mussels and barnacles and oysters. It's definitely unsettling to look at. It reminds me of that picture that's floated around online for ages with the, uh, the teddy bear with the human teeth or the smiling dog that looks like it has uh, human teeth. It's just uncomfortable to look at. Don't like it. Finally, at our number one spot, we have the zombie ant fungus. Now, this is all gonna sound like something from a 1950s sci-fi monster movie, but it is very much real. There is a fungus called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis that is known to invade the bodies of ants, basically turning them into mindless zombies. When infected with a spore, the ant will start to behave strangely eventually, They'll be compelled to leave their nest and climb onto a plant stem. And then they'll ascend to the perfect height where there's the right humidity for the fungus to continue to grow. And the ant will cling to a leaf and remain there until a long stalk starts growing out of its head. And inside of this stalk are more spores, spores that will be released and rain down on the uninfected ants below, infecting them with the fungus too, and on and on it goes. Life as an insect sounds absolutely horrifying. Not only are you under constant threat of massive sized predators, but you also have to worry about a fungus that can grow inside your body and take over your brain? No thank you. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Guinea worm disease. This is a neglected tropical disease that is caused by a parasite and it really is just terrible. This disease unfortunately affects poor communities, especially in remote areas of the world, that do not have water that is safe to drink. Basically what happens with this disease is a person will become infected after drinking water containing the water fleas that are infected with the larva of the Guinea worm. That already sounds terrible terrible to me, but it does get worse. The worms will then penetrate the digestive tract and stay here while they grow to size. Okay, even worse, but it keeps going. About a year later, these horrible creatures will then migrate to a spot where they want to exit, normally somewhere on a lower limb. From here, they will create a very painful blister on the skin, which will eventually burst into an excruciatingly painful open wound. From here, the real nightmare starts, because not only is the pain terrible, but it will last for several weeks while a long, sometimes up to one meter, string-like worm will slowly crawl out of this wound. It honestly makes me sick thinking about it. This process can have a person totally unable to really move for around three to 10 weeks. It takes for the worm to leave the body. This is complete nightmare fuel. At this point, there isn't a treatment or prevention for this disease other than having access to safe water, of course, which should be a reality for every human. In good news, however, the number of cases of this has dropped drastically since the mid-1980s, and hopefully it could be on its way to eradication. All in all, unless you want a complete horror show and some awful imagery burned into your brain forever, maybe skip the Google search of this one. All right, I told you what you need to know. In our number nine spot today, we have locked-in syndrome. We've all heard of sleep paralysis, but what if I told you that there was a worse, scarier version of it? Locked-in syndrome is like sleep paralysis, but the awake version. It's a condition which renders the patient completely unable to move, aside from vertical eye movements and blinking. The patient is completely conscious and aware of what is happening, and able to communicate with eye movements, but everything else is well, locked in. The cause of this is due to damage in the lower brain and brain stem with no damage to the upper parts. This can happen from things like poisoning, a brain stem stroke, a traumatic brain injury, or a lesion of the brain stem, as well as many other factors. The scariest thing, however, is that there is an even worse version called total locked-in syndrome, where the patient isn't even able to move their eyes. Unfortunately, most people who experience this never have any significant motor function return, as there really isn't a cure. There have been people who have made a spontaneous full recovery though, so there certainly is hope. But aside from this hope, learning about this sent me down a total rabbit hole of similar conditions I had no idea about. I don't know how people get through medical school learning about the multitude of horrifying things that could potentially happen to a person. In our number eight spot today, we have trypophobia. This word was really coined or created back in 2005 when someone posted about it on an online forum. And although it is not an officially recognized disorder, it is possible to be diagnosed 
diagnosed as a specific phobia in extreme cases, and it's a thing that many, many of us experience on some level. Basically, Wikipedia describes trypophobia as, quote, an aversion to the sight of irregular patterns or clusters of small holes or bumps. This means that a Google search of the word will have all of the worst images for someone experiencing trypophobia popping up right at the top. It's honestly so strange how something like this could make such a large number of people horrifically uncomfortable, but alas, it really does. Scientists aren't quite sure how trypophobia really developed, there's quite a limited understanding of it due to limited research, but right now the leading theory is that it is possible that it could be a bit of an evolutionary revulsion where we as humans associate this sort of imagery with disease or poison or other danger. Well that is pretty fascinating, I'm just warning you, the results could be nauseating. I'm like mid-level trypophobic, I feel like, like I experience mild discomfort seeing these images, but I know for some some people it's full blown horror. If you're a trypophobe though, you might want to skip this next point. In our number 7 spot today we have the surname Toad Birth. Okay. So these little toads, Suriname toads, are these flat, leaf-looking amphibians from South America and they find their home in the rainforests of the area. That is all fine. Frogs are kind of cute. That is until it's time for these guys to reproduce. That is because during mating season, the males will deposit dozens of fertilized eggs onto the female's backs. Okay, a little unusual, not too bad. Well, until that female's skin starts to grow around these eggs like bubble wrap to keep them safe. For the next few months, the eggs develop in these little special enclosures, but once it's time for birth is where the real horror starts. These little guys eventually just erupt from the back of the mom. It's just a horrifying birthing experience. And if you have trypophobia, like we just talked about, then this is truly a worse nightmare. To anyone, this is a pretty disgusting sight, but that fear will only heighten the dramatics of this one. There are plenty of videos of this birthing process all over the internet, and while some of these videos definitely went viral, it's for all of the wrong reasons. In our number 6 spot today we have the seahorse birth. Speaking of animals giving birth in strange ways, let's talk about the reasons why you should never google a seahorse giving birth. I can't be the only one who is highly, highly uncomfortable by the site, but I'm not entirely sure why I don't like it. Seahorses are pretty cool, they're pretty cute, and generally I personally don't have a problem with them. That is, until they start shooting out kids by the dozen. There aren't many birthing processes that look like it's a fun nice time, but this one really just looks stressful. An interesting thing about seahorse reproduction is that the males of this species are actually responsible for carrying the children. Seahorse fathers incubate their developing embryos in a pouch located on their tail. Their tail basically serves is the equivalent of a female uterus seen in mammals. When birthing time rolls around, these fathers are giving birth by basically shooting these babies out of the tail, but there's thousands of them. It looks like the seahorse is having contractions or maybe something similar. Definitely not a scientist, but with every contraction, thousands of tiny little baby seahorses pop out. And while the miracle of life is a beautiful process, it also leaves me feeling really uncomfortable. Super happy for the new dad and all, just don't want to be flooded with seahorse birthing videos, personally. In our number 5 spot today we have Epidermolysis bullosa. With every part of this series I learn about one more thing I didn't know I needed to be afraid of, and this is one of those things. This skin condition is quite a rare one, and it is one that affects the skin. It causes the skin to be extremely fragile, and often blistering. These blisters can occur from the simplest things like minor injuries, even from just rubbing or scratching. There are even some more severe cases where this blistering can can occur inside of the body, like on the inside of the mouth or even the inside of the stomach, which sounds so awful. This is something that is inherited and while you normally can tell soon after birth, sometimes symptoms don't present themselves until teenage or young adult years. Symptoms include things like fragile skin that blisters easily, especially on the palms and feet, nails that are thick or unformed, scalp blistering and hair loss, skin that looks thin, and dental problems such as tooth decay. Unfortunately, there is not a cure for this skin condition, and treatment just focuses on healing present blisters and trying to prevent new ones. All in all, this sounds like a really painful thing for those who have to deal with it, and googling this term will have some really graphic and sometimes even gory photos coming up, which is exactly why it's a term that is best to stay away from when it comes to the search bar. Being informed is great. Seeing horrifying images? Well, 
less great, for sure. In our number four spot today, we have the Wandering Black Hole. The James Webb Telescope is one of the most exciting space tools of all time, and it has already revealed some incredible information and photos to us in its debut year. But in order to fully feel how incredible these things are, we have to remember where we came from. The James Webb was preceded by the infamous Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble walked so James Webb could run. Since its launch into low Earth orbit in the 1990s, this space telescope telescope has been delivering us amazing space discoveries, and this one is a bit of a frightening one. Back in 2017, the Hubble located a black hole, which is already frightening, but this one was peculiar. That is because they found out that this one was being pulled or manipulated by gravitational waves. Basically what this means is that at some point, this black hole is going to escape its own galaxy and begin roaming the universe. Black holes are bad enough. I don't want them to start wandering around. Turns out, however, that this really is a possibility, and it's happened in more than this one instance. Googling these wandering black holes is sure to send anyone into a doomsday spin. The good news, however, is that despite this black hole weighing approximately the same as one billion suns as it flies through space at five million miles per hour, it's estimated to be about eight billion light years from Earth. So at this point, we're pretty safe. In our number three spot today, we have the Amazonian giant centipede. These centipedes are the largest centipede species in the world with the ability to grow over a foot. These gross things will prey on basically anything they can, which includes other large insects, spiders, millipedes, scorpions, even tarantulas. But because they're so huge, it also includes small lizards, frogs, snakes, mice, and even bats. They have crazy hunting techniques for the largest of their prey and have been known to climb on the ceiling of caves in order to get the bats, which is both incredible and very scary. These things are also venomous, and while it hasn't been a common occurrence for humans to die from a bite, there is one recorded incident that took place in 2014. This incident happened in Venezuela, and a person passed away after being bitten by one of these giant centipedes after it had hidden itself in an empty soda can. There are a lot of dangerous things crawling around on the forest floor of the Amazon, but this one might take the cake on the most disgusting looking. In our number two spot today, we have invisible fire. A lot of these horrible Horrible searches are horrible because of the images that the search will reveal, but for this one, the issue with it is the fact that you can't see it. Invisible fires are actually ethanol fires. These are the fires that are created by alcohol, even the kinds we drink, and motor fuel as well, which is why they can be quite an issue for race car drivers and crews. Ethanol burns blue and smokeless, but these blue flames can be virtually invisible to the naked eye. This provides an incredibly huge obstacle, obviously. We now know how dangerous and deadly fires can be. Be. So how do we fight something that is dangerous and deadly, but that we can't see? It truly is one of those things that upon learning about, I suddenly developed some sort of an irrational fear over it. And that one scene in Talladega Nights makes a lot more sense now. In our number one spot today, we have alien hand syndrome. If someone told me about this before I made this list, I would have thought that they were trying to play like a silly little trick on me, but this one really does exist. Alien hand syndrome is an eerie phenomenon that occurs when a person suddenly does not have control over their hand or any limb anymore. The hand will begin acting acting like it has a mind of its own, which truly is a terrifying thought. Sometimes people will find themselves in a situation where they're forced to keep the alien hand under control with a hand they thankfully still have control over so as to ensure they don't harm themselves or anyone else. The most common factor regarding this syndrome is that the primary motor cortex, which controls the hand movement, is isolated from the premotor cortex influences, but it still remains intact and able to execute movements. All in all, this isn't like the deadliest one on this list but it certainly is very, very creepy. And unless you want to be incredibly freaked out, I would potentially refrain from Googling it. Number 10. Chinese foot binding wasn't just to please men. Women have historically gone to extreme measures to meet cultural standards of beauty to attract the opposite sex, from wearing tight corsets to walking in heels. In China, this standard of beauty was achieved by foot binding. A young girl's bones were broken and her feet tightly bound so that her lotus feet now appeared small and dainty. In their research book Bound Feet, Young Hands, author Lauren Bosman and Hill Gates revealed that some girls' feet 
were bound at a very young age not to catch a husband, but to force them to work. What's groundbreaking about our work is that foot binding was not confined to the elite, Lauren the book's co-author told HuffPost. The study, Lauren added, dispels the view that the goal was only to try to please men. The authors interviewed over 1,800 women across China to undercover that foot binding was prevalent among many peasant families to create immobility for girls so that they would stick around and do hard work that their families depended on for selling goods. And I feel like hearing this just makes it even worse. Number 9. Alexander Graham Bell Didn't Invent the Telephone Alexander Graham Bell wasn't the inventor of the telephone like we were all taught, but he was the first to patent it. Turns out Bell was actually one of several men who were working on the telephone idea at the same time, but he got to the patent office before them. However, in 2002, US Congress recognized impoverished Florentine immigrant as the inventor of the telephone rather than Alexander Graham Bell. The Guardian reported historians and Italian Americans won their battle to pursue Washington to recognize a little known mechanical genius, Antonio Massi, as the father of modern communications 113 years after his death. The resolution declared Antonio's Telediferno, demonstrated in New York in 1860, made him the inventor of the telephone in the place of Bell, even though it was Bell who took out a patent 16 years later. It is the sense of the House of Representatives that the life and achievements of Antonio Masui should be recognized and his work in the invention of the telephone should be acknowledged, the resolution stated. So he didn't invent it, he just made it first. Number 8. Vincent Van Gogh Wasn't Romantic The story of Vincent Van Gogh's severed ear is legendary in the art world, but he definitely didn't do it for love or mail it to his girlfriend. Van Gogh cut off his left ear when tempers flared with Paul Gagan, the artist with whom he had been working for. It wasn't for love, it happened during one of his mental breakdowns. Also, there's a rumor that he ate yellow paint in hopes to be happy. Now, this has never been proven, but if he did eat specifically yellow paint, it wasn't to make him happy. He struggled with mental health issues, yes, but he would have eaten it because he knew it was bad for him and he wanted to end his life. He was smart enough to know that eating it wouldn't make him happy. Like, Come on. During his time at the institution in St. Remy, he wrote a letter to Theo. It appears that I pick up filthy things and eat them, although my memories of these bad moments are vague. The medical notes of Dr. Pryron, his physician, revealed that he wanted to poison himself by eating paint and drinking turpentine. That's probably why he wasn't allowed in his studio while he was suffering from his attacks. So no, it wasn't because he wanted to be happy, it was because he wanted to end his life. So no, he did not do any of these things because it was romantic, it was because he he was mentally ill and struggling. Number 7. The Wright Brothers Weren't the First to Fly We were taught that the Wright Brothers were the first men to fly, but that is wrong. They did come up with the first truly controllable aircraft, but the real claim for first in flight fame goes to German immigrant named Gustav Whitehead that occurred in Bridgeport, Connecticut. In 2013, James All the World's Aircraft, which calls itself the world's foremost authority on aviation history, named the August 1901 flight by Whitehead as the first successful powered flight in history. Jane reviewed evidence from aviation researcher John Brown that Whitehead may have made one and possibly two flights in a small monoplane of his own design and powered by a tiny motor also of his own design as early as 1901, which was two full years before the Wright brothers. Number 6. America wasn't the good guy in World War II. Okay, I know how that sounds. So. Hear me out. World War II is often hailed as the last war where there were clean lines between the good guys and bad guys. The Axis powers wanted to take over the world, the Allies wanted to stop them. But it's not that simple. American GIs were responsible for war crimes on par with the acts committed by their Japanese and German enemies. For example, in 1943, US soldiers invaded the island of Sicily and ended the lives of at least 77 POWs in what's known as the Biscari Massacre. Even though they were fighting for freedom, these troops through the Geneva Convention right out the window. GIs were also responsible for taking advantage of approximately 14,000 women in England, Germany and France from 1942 to 1945. However, things took a truly barbaric turn in the Pacific theater. Even though it was illegal, American troops made it a habit of taking trophies from dead Japanese soldiers. And you know, not fumbling through their pockets or taking their weapons, GIs actually chopped off ears, pulled out teeth and took bones 
phones as mementos to send to their parents, wives, and girlfriends. Number five, residential schools. Many people think Canada is all sunshine and rainbows, but we actually have our own dark past. In Canada, the Indian residential school system was a network of boarding schools for indigenous peoples. The network was funded by the Canadian government's Department of Indian Affairs and administrated by Christian churches. The school system was created to isolate indigenous children from the influence of their own culture and religion in order to assimilate them into the dominant Canadian culture. Over the course of the system's more than 100 year existence, around 150,000 children were placed in residential schools nationally. The residential school system harmed indigenous children significantly by removing them from their families, depriving them of their ancestral languages, and mistreating them both physically and mentally. Conditions in the school led to student malnutrition, starvation, and disease. The legacy of the system has been linked to increased prevalence of post traumatic stress, alcoholism, use of illegal substances, and generational trauma in indigenous peoples. The number of school related deaths remains unknown due to incomplete records, but estimates range from 3,200 to over 30,000, and there are thousands of unmarked graves for the poor students. It's disgusting that this happened, and Canada has still not shown how sorry they are for these crimes. Number four, only gay men got AIDS. The AIDS epidemic caused by HIV found its way to the United States between the 1970s and 1980s. During the epidemic of the 1980s, LGBTQ plus communities were further stigmatized as they became the focus of mass hysteria, suffered isolation and marginalization, and were targeted with extreme attacks of violence in the United States. This is because it was known as a gay disease, which simply isn't true. Diseases don't discriminate based on sexual orientation, but due to this myth, many people didn't get the help they needed when it came to AIDS. One of the best known works on the history of HIV and AIDS is the 1987 book and the band played on by Randy Schultz, which claims that Ronald Reagan's administration dragged its feet in dealing with the crisis due to homophobia, while the gay community viewed early reports and public health measures with corresponding distrust, thus allowing the disease to spread further and infect hundreds of thousands more. US leaders had remained largely silent and unresponsive to the health emergency, and it wasn't until September 1985, four years after the crisis began, that President Ronald Reagan first publicly mentioned AIDS. If Reagan took steps four years earlier to help and wasn't so homophobic, many, many lives would have been saved. But he ignored it. As of 2018, 700,000 people have died of HIV or AIDS in the United States since the beginning of the epidemic, and nearly 13,000 people with AIDS in the United States die each year. Number three, slavery wasn't just in the South. Though school taught us something different, Southerners were not the only ones who owned slaves in the United States. The colonial North thrived on the slave trade in the 1700s. During the Revolution, George Washington told Northern and Southern colonists that we must fight the British so we don't become as tame and abject slaves as the blacks we rule over with such arbitrary sway. By 1804, slavery was abolished in the North, but not all at once. Some states left in provisions to slowly free slaves over time, and by 1840, Connecticut still had 17 slaves listed on the census. In New York City, the situation was especially shameful. A fifth of the city's population was slaves in 1740, and New York had the second highest rate of slave ownership in the country, behind only only Charleston, South Carolina. 42% of residents own slaves, according to the New York Public Library. 42 percent. Slave labor built much of the city, and although they didn't have to work on plantations, they were still considered property to be bought, sold, and used. Number two, the truth about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving didn't start off happy like it is now. According to Ramona Peters, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe's tribal historic preservation officer, quoted in the Indian Country Today media network, President Lincoln promoted the celebration of a happy meal between the pilgrims and the Indians to create a feeling of harmony and bring together a country after the Civil War. But there was nothing harmonious about how the Thanksgiving holiday came about as it resulted in the death of an entire Indian tribe. In 1636, when a dead man was discovered in a boat in Plymouth, English Major John Mason and his soldiers blamed the Piquette Indians. They then ended the lives of 400 of them in retribution, including women and the young. The governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, William Newell, proclaimed from this day forth shall be a day of celebration and Thanksgiving for subduing the piquettes. So yeah, it wasn't at all happy, it was dark. Really dark. 
And coming in at number one is Gandhi wasn't as great as he seemed. Gandhi inspired movements for civil rights and freedom across the world, but most of us don't know that Gandhi abandoned his wife to live with a rich male bodybuilder before he got involved in British Indian relations. Now, if Gandhi was gay, who cares? But Gandhi tried to get all references to homosexual traditions erased from Indian temples in an act he called sexual cleansing. And to test his resistance to sexual temptation, he would sleep in bed naked with young women, including his grand nieces. But worse than his sexual hypocrisy was his terrible racism. Gandhi may have wanted India freed from British rule, but he was perfectly happy with the rigid caste system of the nation. Gandhi wrote of a time when he and his followers were led to a lower caste jail for protesting. We could understand not being classed with whites, but to be placed on the same level as the natives seemed too much to put up with. They are, as a rule, uncivilized, the convicts even more so. They're troublesome, very dirty, and live like animals. When asked about Indian views on race versus white South Africans, he wrote, We believe as much in the purity of races as we think they do. Although Gandhi did bring some good to the world, it's important to note that he wasn't as great as he seemed, and people need to know this. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Cordodes Formosenus. Sure. This is the scientific name for a kind of horsehair worm that has its sights set on the praying mantis. This little parasite, well, not little at all actually, is a type that will pass through a variety of different hosts through its life stages. They start out their life in the guts of small insects that the praying mantis would feed on. From there, once the mantis is nice and infected, these disgusting creatures begin to grow. When the worm is sufficiently mature, it takes control over the insect's body and directs them to a body of water and gets them to jump in, which allows this horrifying thing to swim out. These worms can grow up to 90 centimeters long, which is disgusting, and they are super dangerous to the mantis. That is because when it breaks free in order to go and reproduce itself, it leaves behind a half-empty mantis husk. A search of these guys will have videos and images of these guys coming up, including people dunking, praying mantises into water, and watching these wiggly guys escape. It honestly made me feel sucked to my stomach, so I can't even imagine how the mantis feels. In our number 9 spot today, we have Blank Room Soup. If you've been on the internet for a while, chances are you've probably seen this video floating around. This entire thing really is just the stuff of nightmares. Basically, the video is set in a blank room, and it features a man eating some kind of soup. The soup eater has his face censored, and it sounds like he is crying while eating this soup, and this is all creepy enough, but there is another totally freaky thing in this video. Basically, there's a guy in dark clothing with a mascot head on who is rubbing this guy's back as he eats the soup. Soon, another guy wearing an identical outfit comes in and does the exact same thing. I realize this sounds very strange as I'm explaining it, but it truly is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. For years, rumors swirled about this video, some saying it originated on the dark web, and the guy eating soup was being held against his will, and the soup was made out of his own wife. How horrible is that? While we may have a far less sinister answer as to where this video came from, it truly still is chilling to watch. In our number 8 spot today, we have vent worms under a microscope. This one is so random, I'm not even sure why you would be googling it, but if I'm being honest, you're definitely better off just not doing that. Hydrothermal vents live on the ocean floor and they are the result of tectonic activity. Through this tectonic activity, as seawater seeps downward through the oceanic crust, it gets really hot and becomes very rich in chemicals. This leads to the water becoming so buoyant that it comes back out of the surface of the sea floor, and that is what is called a hydrothermal vent. The water coming out of the vent is that same super hot, super chemically rich water, and it is an extremely important part of underwater ecosystems. The water from the vent is highly acidic and hot, while the water in the depths of the ocean is slightly basic and freezing cold. There are many different smaller species who come to the vent areas because of the chemicals in the water, as well as the heat, which helps certain types of food sources grow, which they then want to consume. One of these creatures is aptly named the vent worm. These guys are super tiny and they can't really be seen with the naked eye and we should consider ourselves lucky for that because of what they look like under a microscope. These creatures are fully nightmare inducing with creepy hook like teeth. I'm just glad they aren't an everyday occurrence in the ocean because uh, I would never go swimming again. 
In our number seven spot today, we have the Australian paralysis tick. Ticks are considered ectoparasites since they wreak havoc on their host from the outside of the body, while most other parasites need to be inside the body. There are, of course, different kinds of ticks that can transmit diseases such as Lyme disease, but in these kinds of cases, the transmission of disease is not actually the tick's goal, which is why today we are talking specifically about the Australian paralysis tick. These ticks purposefully secrete a neurotoxin that causes paralysis. All right, definitely not good, but this can be especially dangerous depending on the different areas that the tick paralyzes because it has the ability to paralyze something like the lungs which of course would be a very bad situation. The good news is, is that once the tick is removed, the effects of the toxin should wear off completely. I thought when I get the chance to go to Australia, my only worries would be the snakes and the spiders, but I guess I'll just add this tick to the list. Safe to say these creepy crawlies are just one Google search away from sending you down a rabbit hole of the disgusting. In our number six spot today, we have Vandelia serosa. Vandelia serosa is a very tiny eel-like parasitic fish. Yeah, I guess this is just a parasite list now. This is what happened. I googled one of these guys and then went on a spree. That's why I'm warning you against it. These guys feed on other fish by swimming into their gills, where they then began drinking their blood, which gave them the nickname vampire fish. Vampire fish can also enter the human body through any orifice it finds. Okay, and it will drink human blood as well. They have backwards facing spines, so they will lodge themselves wherever they enter the body. After filling up on their tasty meal, they usually end up passing away there, but they are bloated from eating so much. This means that surgery will be required in order to remove it, and depending on where it ended up, this surgery has varying degrees of difficulty. If you get what I'm saying, orifices, surgery, it's not good. In our number five spot today, we have the hagfish. There are about 76 different species of hagfish, and some of them are known to live as deep as 5,500 feet below the surface of the ocean. While hagfish isn't particularly the best name in the world, they are also known by the equally disgusting name of slime eels. These creatures definitely are pretty horrendous to look at, no offense to them. Rather than a mouth with a jaw, these strange looking creatures instead just have a ring of razor sharp teeth. Really love it. They use these teeth to burrow into the flesh of dead whales on the sea floor, and once inside, they then basically just stay there and eat their way from the inside out. That is all horrible enough, but what's worse is how they got their slimy nicknames. Basically, their body produces a sort of goop that is used to ward off predators. If they are stuck in the clutches of a terrifying predator, they release what is described as, quote, copious amounts of this slimy goop that is designed to clog the mouth or gills of said predator, which will hopefully have them releasing these little devils. Aside from this defense mechanism, if their slime doesn't work and they find themselves still caught in the grasp of a predator, they can sort of tie themselves into a knot in order to hopefully escape the clutches. All in all, a creepy, slithery little slimy creature with a ring of razors for a mouth, it's just a thing I personally would rather not search up on the web. In our number four spot today, we have the wandering black hole. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of the most important scientific creations of all time. The Hubble walked so James Webb could run. Since its launch into low Earth orbit in the 1990s, this space has been delivering us amazing space discoveries, and this one is a bit of a frightening one. Back in 2017, the Hubble located a black hole, which is already frightening, but this one was peculiar. That is because they found that this one was being pulled or manipulated by gravitational waves. Basically, what this means is that at some point, this black hole is going to escape its own galaxy and begin roaming around the universe. Black holes are bad enough. I don't want them to start wandering around. The good news, however, is that despite this black hole weighing approximately the same as one billion suns as it flies through through space at 5 million miles per hour, it's estimated to be about 8 billion light years away from Earth. So we're pretty safe at this point. But here's the thing, if we found one, it is very likely that there are many more out there. One search of this wandering black hole and you are going down a space rabbit hole of only the most terrifying things. In our number three spot today, we have the Rat King. I would have thought that this was just the male antagonist in the Nutcracker, but turns out it is far, far worse. Rats are pretty freaky to many people for a variety of reasons, but the image of this one is even worse than just a single standalone rat. Basically, the term Rat King refers to a large group of rats that all 
all have their tails tied together at the end. It is indeed a rare occurrence and the tails could be stuck together for a variety of reasons. Whether it's because the hair got entangled together, there's some sort of sticky substance holding them together, or just, you know, a regular old knot. Whatever the case is, a Google search of this term will only have images coming up and it truly is unsettling to see. It's obviously sad because no one wants to see an animal in a tricky situation, but also, it's rats. Rats are creepy. A bunch of rats all tied together is extra creepy. The reports of these rat kings mainly come from European countries, and although the existence of this phenomena is for some reason debated due to the limited evidence of its natural occurrence, there are still plenty of terrifying image results any search will yield. In our number two spot today, we have a pilot's view in a storm. Taylor and I were on a plane this week, a few actually, so when I found out about this via watching a video, I was thankful I hadn't seen it before our flight. The view for a pilot has got to be pretty great for a lot of the job. Flying over beautiful places with incredible sights, that sounds amazing. And you know, pilots have only the best eyesight, so they're seeing it all super well. Flying at night, however, well, for pilots, I'm sure it's totally fine and normal, but when the average passenger catches a glimpse of what they are seeing, especially when the weather isn't exactly being kind, well, it was definitely enough to totally freak me out. A Google search of what a pilot sees when flying at night through a snowstorm isn't exactly a comforting sight. In fact, it's absolutely terrifying. It looks like we're traveling to another universe, not just barreling through our skies. I, of course, trust the pilots who have the training and the expertise, but it's just very unnerving to know what they are seeing while I'm just passed out with my neck pillow, you know? In our number one spot today, we have the hairy frog. Last time we talked about some weird frogs, today we've got another kind. This frog isn't poisonous. It isn't growing eggs out of its back. These frogs simply just are hairy, and it is so unsettling. The Central African Trichobatatrachus robustus. These frogs, they're often referred to as the hairy frog or the horror frog, which I really agree with. These frogs have the unusual feature of having a thick mane of hair that is seen on their flanks and hind legs in the males of the species. According to experts, many believe that this feature is useful to the frogs because it could help them to stay underwater for longer periods of time. This proves to be extremely useful when they are tasked with guarding the female's eggs. This isn't the only weird feature of these frogs, however. Unfortunately, frogs also have claws. These bones burst through the toes of their hind legs, and it is said that they are used in, quote, interspecific combat. This has all led to these guys receiving the nickname Wolverine Frog, which I honestly think is the most apt. Maybe they'll make a, an appearance in Deadpool 3. Who knows? Starting us off at number 10 is divorce. Well, today you can pretty much get a divorce for, well, really any reason you want. That wasn't always the case. In fact, prior to being able to file over irreconcilable differences like most couples do now, pretty much only men were allowed to divorce their wives, not the other way around. Unless that is, the wife could prove her husband's impotence. As it was seen as a woman's legal duty to bestow a child to her husband, if he couldn't give her the goods per se, she could file for an annulment of the marriage. But how did the court go about proving this, you ask? Well, of course they couldn't just take the woman's word for it, so they would bring in a witness, usually a sex worker, to try and arouse the man. That or the court would enter your marital bedroom and, well, you know, see for themselves just how well the man could get the job done. If he did in fact have any issues completing his manly duties, the woman could be freed of the marriage. Just be careful they don't accuse you of becoming a witch. Next up at number 9 is man-made fertilizer. The Battle of Waterloo in 1815 resulted in the death of an estimated 60,000 soldiers, but not many of these bones have ever been recovered. And the reason why is pretty grim. In a strange, twisted series of events, the English decided to clear the field of the corpses and put the bones to use in a rather effective, but albeit creepy way. Newspapers of the time reported that the fallen French army were ground up in Yorkshire factories and the bone dust was added to their manure. Apparently the oil from the marrow proved especially helpful in the grave robbing turned fertilizer plan, and the fertilizer was purchased by farmers across England and scattered widely to help grow their crops. Meaning that an entire generation of England ate food made possible with the help of dead French soldiers. Coming in at number 8 is Ching Shi Huang. Before the understanding of modern science, there was a lot of ideas about elixirs and remedies that have quite 
literally no logic to back them up. Now, of course, it wasn't their fault. They truthfully didn't know any better. But looking back, that doesn't make it any less wild. The first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, was one of the many intent on finding the elixir of immortality, and so he demanded his royal doctors find this magical potion for him, otherwise he would have them killed. I mean, just real low stakes stuff. Eventually, likely under the duress of not wanting to be killed, and also probably not knowing what they were doing, they offered him a magic potion that they promised would bring him eternal life. The magic potion, however, was actually just mercury, and the emperor ended up dying from poisoning himself. A bit ironic that in the pursuit of eternal life, he actually only made his life shorter. Coming in at number 7 is Henry Rathbone. During school, we all learn about John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Lincoln at the Ford's Theatre in Washington. But did you know that that wasn't the only tragedy to occur due to that night's events? In the theatre with Lincoln that night was his wife, along with Henry Rathbone, a military officer, and his girlfriend Clara. At the time of the assassination, Rathbone saw Booth and tried to save Lincoln, but Booth stabbed him before he could reach the president. Although he physically survived the attack, he left with a deep-seated guilt about not being able to save the president's life. Two years went by, and and despite trying to move on from the tragedy by marrying Clara and starting a family, his mind never fully recovered and he became more and more paranoid about the world around him. He began claiming to hear voices speak to him from behind the walls that would taunt him endlessly, until eventually they pushed him towards complete breakdown. Convinced it was the only option, Rathbone shot and killed his wife before stabbing himself in an attempt to take his own. But just like before, he survived the attack on himself. Eventually, he was tried for killing his wife and sent to live the rest of his life in an asylum. Coming in at number six is an animal trial. So not only did they have trials over the impotence of a man, believe it or not, you could also take a literal animal to court in the Middle Ages. I kid you not. The whole kitten caboodle would be present. A judge, prosecutor, witnesses, a defense attorney. They truly took it very seriously. The reasoning behind it all, I suppose, was that at the time, law prohibited punishment without trial. For for everything and everyone. The first recorded instance was the prosecution of a pig in France in 1266 accused of eating a young boy. The pig was found guilty for his crime and executed as punishment. If that doesn't sound crazy enough, keep in mind the judge would hold the behavior of the accused animal against it. And if the court didn't feel the animal was acting properly, that was taken into account. These trials were only put on against domestic animals as they truly believed having been in the company of humans, they should know how to act. Now, not all animals were executed for their crimes. Some lesser criminals were merely excommunicated from the church or cursed and sent to live in the wild. But it's still crazy. I mean, honestly, I wish I was making this up. Coming in at number five is John Scott Harrison. Raised by the ninth president of the US, William Henry, and the father of the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, although John Scott himself never rose to presidential ranks, he did served two years in Congress and was a prominent political figure in his time. But one day he decided politics wasn't really for him anymore and spent his last 20 years managing a farm in Ohio. After his death in 1878, his family gathered for the service and took great pains to protect his grave. At the time, grave robbing was at an all-time peak due to the demand for cadavers in medical schools. To avoid having his father be another subject of this, Benjamin had an unusually deep grave made and placed a massive stone that required 16 men to move placed on top of his casket. For extra measure, he then covered the whole ordeal in cement, then placed small wooden pegs below the surface of the covering so that he could tell if it had been disturbed. Oh, and he hired a security guard to watch it day and night for the next 30 days. After noticing a nearby family friend's grave had been exhumed, Benjamin and his nephew went to go and track it down. They managed to obtain a warrant for the Medical College of Ohio and with the help of a detective went to retrieve the corpse of their dear friend. When they arrived, they found a dissecting room on the top floor, but to their surprise, they couldn't find who they were looking for. Instead, they happened upon a body that looked strangely familiar, and when they removed the rags covering the head, they were horrified to discover it was the corpse of one Mr. John Scott Harrison. How the grave robber managed, we will never know. Coming in at number 
number three is Gilles de Rey. Joan of Arc is rightfully so credited as a certified badass and patron saint who was a major defender of the French during the Hundred Years War. Among her most supportive and trusted allies was Gilles de Rey, an esteemed knight in the French army who was appointed the highest military distinction one could receive at the time. But if he was such a big deal and close companion of Joan, why isn't he as widely celebrated? Well, that's because sadly he was actually super evil. By day he was defending France beside Joan of Arc, but at night he was into the senseless killing of minors in occultist rituals. Often he would lure the unsuspecting victims in with psychological torture, convincing them that it was just a game, before bludgeoning them and doing other cruel and unspeakable things to their corpses, supposedly using them for his rituals. Eventually he was found out and tried for his crimes, admitting to all his vicious acts and hanged as punishment. Although no one knows for sure, it's suspected he had nearly 150 victims. Coming in at number two is virginity tests. Back in a time when a woman was merely the property of her husband, there was one very important thing that needed to be assured before the wedding night that she was pure. Mostly because it was believed that the consummation in fact kind of sealed the whole husband owning his wife deal, and if she had done it with anyone else, she didn't really belong to him. Charming. So to ensure that their potential wife was worth the dowry, suitors would perform virginity tests on their brides to be to make sure they weren't getting a secondhand woman, if you will. Such tests included inspecting their urine, as it was believed a virgin's urine would be clear. Other times they would give the woman a special potion, and if she could refrain from peeing, she was a virgin, as if a bladder was any indication of that. Sometimes a physician would be hired to inspect the woman's downstairs area, as they believed they could literally just tell by looking at it. Most common though was to inspect the sheets after the marriage was consummated. If there was blood, hooray, a virgin. If not, well then it was assumed she was a liar and her husband was legally entitled to compensation for being swindled into marrying her. And last up today are syphilis zombies. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how much antibiotics have changed the world around us. Well nowadays a shot of penicillin can keep an early onset of the STI at bay, back in the day it could quite literally be the end of you. In fact, in 1494, Italy experienced one of the worst outbreaks in history, and if you didn't know any better, you might have thought it was a zombie apocalypse. Of course, before there was any kind of real understanding about how these types of diseases could be spread or caught, people were, let's just say, having a lot of fun with each other. But on the flip side of that, if they caught the infection, it would cause flesh to literally dissolve off their bodies until their inevitable death within a few months. It was also widely believed that betting a virgin could cure you of the disease, so that's fun. Apparently it was not uncommon to witness people missing hands, feet, eyes, noses, or look as if they'd been dropped into a vat of acid while walking down the street. Also remember that it took a few months before the disease actually killed them, so they were just living in excruciating pain while their flesh was slowly eaten away, in some cases right down to the bone. With that image in mind, it does make a little bit more sense as to why they believed you would go to hell for premarital relations. Like, I kind of get why they thought it was the devil punishing you for your sins. Thank God for antibiotics. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have walking corpse syndrome. Cotard syndrome, also known as walking corpse syndrome is a rare and severe mental illness that can cause a person to believe that they are dead or do not exist. Individuals with this disorder may also experience delusions of immortality or think that their internal organs have stopped functioning. Basically, those suffering from the syndrome can believe that they don't exist, that they are already dead, or that somehow they have lost all of their organs or other vital fluids. This syndrome can also occur alongside other mental health conditions such as depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder. The causes of this syndrome are not really fully understood, but it is thought to result from abnormalities in brain function and also structure. The treatment for this syndrome typically involves a combination of medication and psychotherapy, and in some really severe cases, hospitalization might also be necessary. Googling this syndrome can definitely send you down a rabbit hole of terrifying things that our brains are capable of doing, and the scary things that they can convince us are real. In our number 9 spot today, we have spontaneous human combustion. Alright, spontaneous.
spontaneous human combustion. Exactly what it sounds like. It is a phenomenon where a human body can seemingly suddenly burst into flames without an external source of ignition. Okay, just add that to the list of things that you should just be terrified of, I guess. Despite numerous reports of such incidents throughout history, the scientific community remains pretty skeptical about the existence of this phenomenon, but there is some very interesting and horrifying evidence. Some theories suggest that certain chemical reactions within the body could lead to the ignition of flammable gases produced by the digestive system. Others believe that external factors such as cigarettes or alcohol consumption may have been involved in the reported cases. While spontaneous human combustion remains a mystery, it continues to fascinate and intrigue scientists and medical professionals and just the general public alike because it is a horrible thought. If it really does exist, it's basically just a game of waiting and hoping not. In our number 8 spot today, we have the sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness, also known as African trypanosomiasis, is a parasitic disease caused by a protozoan parasite. It is transmitted to humans through the bite of the tsetse fly found in rural areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Symptoms of the disease include fever, headache, joint pain, and itching, followed by fatigue, confusion, and disturbed sleep patterns, which is what gives the disease its name. If left untreated, sleeping sickness can lead to severe neurological damage and even death. A diagnosis can actually be very difficult, but early detection and treatment with medication can thankfully cure the disease. Sleeping sickness actually remains a very significant public health problem in many parts of Africa, particularly in areas with limited access to healthcare. Of course, googling this sickness will have images of the fly popping up, photos of infection sites, ill people who are currently dealing with the effects of the illness, and many other just very grim scenarios. All in all, this health Health problem is definitely one that people need to know about so research into it can continue, but just be wary that your search might yield some unsettling results. In our number 7 spot today we have hantavirus. We hear a lot about how rats and mice living among humans was the cause for the hasty spread of disease in time periods like the medieval, and thankfully it seems to be less of a problem now, but that doesn't mean the problem has simply ceased. Aside from stealing your food, there are still many viruses these pesky critters can spread, and one of those is hantavirus. The virus is found in their urine, droppings, and saliva, and it can be spread to people when they come into contact with contaminated surfaces or inhale the virus in the air. Symptoms of hantavirus infection can range from mild flu-like symptoms to more severe respiratory and kidney problems. There is no specific treatment or vaccine for hantavirus infection, and it can even be fatal in some cases. Okay? Prevention measures include controlling rodent populations, of course, avoiding contact with rodent excrement, which should just be a goal on a day-to-day, -day, and taking precautions when cleaning areas with signs of rodent into activity. If you've got a mouse problem, you might want to stop procrastinating that call to the exterminator. It might be more urgent than you once thought. In our number six spot today, we have anesthesia awareness. This is something you should definitely never Google if you're a person who already has anxiety surrounding surgery, or if you or anyone you know and love is getting surgery soon, okay? Just, you don't want to hear about it. Anesthesia awareness, also known as unintended intraoperative awareness, is a rare but very distressing complex application of general anesthesia. It occurs when a patient is aware of their surroundings in the surgical procedure being performed on them despite being given medication to render them unconscious and unaware. Like your body is asleep, but your mind is very, very awake. Anesthesia awareness can cause significant psychological trauma and may result in long-term mental health issues such as PTSD. Patients who experience this phenomenon may report feelings of panic, helplessness, and even pain during surgery. Although the incident of anesthesia awareness is very low, estimated to occur in less than 1% of all surgeries, it remains a concern for both patients and healthcare providers. Various risk factors have been identified, such as the use of muscle relaxants, inadequate dosing of the anesthesia, and just different medical conditions. There are, thankfully, preventative measures in place to try and avoid this type of scenario, and you can absolutely chat with your doctor if you're worried about this sort of thing, but at the end of the day, just knowing about it is enough to give me chill. In our number five spot today, we have rabies. <laughs> Just so that's it. Okay, I feel like when I was a kid, we heard a lot about rabies for some reason. But now as an adult, 
We don't really talk about it very often. That's fine. I mean, I don't have a lot of reason to talk about rabies, but I don't think I ever realized how serious it actually is and how it affects people. And now that I've Googled it, I've gone down into the depths of the internet about Rabies. Rabies is a viral disease that affects the nervous system of mammals, including humans, of course, and it is transmitted through the saliva of an infected animal, usually through a bite or a scratch. Once the virus enters the body, it travels to the brain and causes inflammation, which leads to a range of symptoms. These include fever, headache, muscle weakness. As the disease progresses, the person may experience more severe symptoms like hallucinations, seizures, and paralysis. Searching and learning more, seeing it in action, and all of that honestly is just terrifying. Rabies is very serious and is a potentially fatal disease if left untreated. It is preventable, thankfully, with the use of vaccines and proper medical care after exposure, but without access to these sorts of things, it can be extremely dangerous. To help avoid with problems like this, it's best to limit contact with wild animals, particularly bats, raccoons, skunks, and foxes, which are common carriers of the virus. So if you live in really any city in Canada, Good luck, man. <laughs> They're just all of them, just around. In our number four spot today, we have fatal familial insomnia. Fatal familial insomnia, or FFI, is an extremely rare and fatal genetic disorder that affects the brain. It is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, which means that an affected person has a 50% chance of passing the disease onto their offspring. The onset of FFI usually occurs somewhere in the middle of life and is characterized by progressive insomnia, which worsens over time and is accompanied by hallucinations delirium, and eventually dementia. The disease can progress rapidly with death occurring within a few months to a few years after the onset of symptoms. FFI is caused by a mutation in the PRNP gene, which leads to the formation of an abnormal prion protein in the brain. This protein accumulates and damages brain tissue, leading to the symptoms of FFI. Unfortunately, there is no cure for FFI, and treatment is really limited to just alleviating symptoms. Research into the disease is ongoing and scientists hope to one day find a cure or a way to prevent the disease from developing. Searching this terrifying and very real disorder can lead you to the terrifying world of prions and all of the horrors that surround them. In our number three spot today, we have the Dyatlov Pass incident. Okay, if you want to be a part of one of the most enduring mysteries, then you need to learn about the Dyatlov Pass incident. If you've never heard of it, basically in February of 1959, nine young Soviet Soviet hikers sent out to trek through the Ural Mountains. They'd set up a camp and sometime during the night something happened that made them cut their way out of the tent and all flee the site. Leaving in such a rush, they were of course underdressed for the bitterly cold weather and six of them ended up passing away from hypothermia, which is extremely tragic. The other three, however, is where this story takes a very frightening turn. Like I mentioned before, no one knows why they fled the tent in the first place and the last three hikers were found passed away with severe Severe signs of physical trauma that no one could agree on what had caused it. In 2019, the investigation was reopened, and just a couple years ago, there was a conclusion that a kind of avalanche called a slab avalanche was the cause for these injuries. Before you come at me in the comments, I know not everyone is convinced that's what happened, and I don't blame you. Many people don't agree with this quote official conclusion, and when you learn about the nature of the injuries, it really does seem strange. This remains one of those cases that people just just can't quite agree on what happened, and learning about it only leaves you with more questions than answers. In our number two spot today, we have the Hoyabak monster. This monster is a mysterious creature that has allegedly been sighted in the dense forests of Germany. It is said to be a humanoid creature standing over seven feet tall with long arms and a muscular build covered in matted fur. Witnesses describe it as having a broad, flat face with glowing eyes and large fangs protruding from its mouth. The first reported sighting of this monster dates back to the early 20th century, but there have been numerous sightings reported in the decades since. Many locals believe it to be a malevolent being, and there are stories of it attacking and killing livestock and even humans who venture too close to its territory. Despite numerous attempts to capture or study the creature, there is no concrete evidence of its existence that has ever been found, and some skeptics dismiss this monster as nothing more than a myth or a legend, but others remain convinced that it is a real, undiscovered species lurking in the forests. 
Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Cattle Crimes. Adding one more enduring unsolved mystery to this list, we have these crimes which were revealed when a set of documents became declassified and they described this super grim FBI investigation that took place in the mid 1970s at the request of US Senators Floyd Haskell of Colorado and Carl Curtis of Nebraska. I guess there was some weird sort of connection between these horrific things being done to cattle across as many as 21 states. In a letter, from 1975, Senator Haskell was able to identify 130 of these strange macabre cases in Colorado alone. All of the cases were eerily similar, which is unsettling considering the details. In most cases, the cattle would have their left ear, left eye, rectum, and reproductive organ all missing, and all the blood was drained from the carcass, but there was no blood on the ground around them, nor were there any footprints. How absolutely horrifying is that? Some people chose to believe that the cause for these was mysterious helicopters and UFOs, but there's a letter from Senator Curtis to the FBI director that says, quote, the series of incidents stretching from Oklahoma to Nebraska in which cattle have been dismembered in some kind of strange witchcraft cult. I'm not gonna lie, I don't think UFOs or witches did it. It wasn't until 1979 that the FBI was granted jurisdiction to begin investigating these weird happenings, and when they did, they determined that most of the instances were the result of quote, normal predator and scavenger activity. And while that answer sounds a little fishy, the documents went forward to reveal that not all of the instances could be accounted for. Also, this idea of it being a completely normal scenario also contradicts reports that say that the techniques used in these horrible instances were quote, very professional, and sometimes even referred to as being conducted with surgical precision. I'm sorry, but a wolf, or a coyote, or a bear, or whatever predator you want to say did this, ripping apart its meal isn't exactly a surgically precise operation. No arrests were ever made, and while it was deemed solved, a ton of mystery still surrounds these stories to this day. Pretend like we always do, we have almost every single year dating back from 1856, an aircraft or a flight has gone missing. The most recent missing aircraft went missing last June. So along with the aircraft, two people went missing as well. So this took place in central BC. This is in Canada. The year before that, 29 people went missing on an Air Force flight that was en route from Tabram, India to Port Blair, India. The plane went missing over the Bay of Bengal. The search for the aircraft and the missing people became India's biggest search and rescue in history. What's freaky is that means that one plane this year is almost certainly going to disappear. The question is what plane and when is it going to happen? And also how many people are going to be on it? And listen to this, over the last 70 years, 90 commercial airlines have disappeared. Moving into number 9, it's time to freak out a little bit because mites are living in our eyelashes. That's a fact. 65 species are known to have demodex mites living on our hair follicles. Humans are one of those species that have these demodex mites and in fact we have two different types of them. Demodex folliculum and we have the demodex Demodex brevis. These are frequently referred to as eyelash mites, and most people we don't have any symptoms, but there are other people that can swell up from it. Okay, so here's something else that will freak you out in number eight. First, listen to this. Okay, so what you just heard was a recording back in 1977. It was a radio signal that was received from deep space. The noise lasted for about 72 seconds. So back about 40 years ago, someone from outer space tried to contact us. This signal was recorded at the Big Air Radio Telescope of the Ohio State University. Right now, the signal is being called the wow signal. And scientists and experts have been trying to understand what this recording means. Are we being invaded? This signal has been used many times to help support that there is extraterrestrial intelligence in outer space. I mean, is this real life right now? Do you guys believe in that there's something out there? Are there aliens? Okay, it's time for human teeth that was found on a fish, and this comes into number seven. This is insane. Imagine going fishing, and you just caught this. This could be the creepiest thing ever. I would just snap the line and just let the fish go. There's no way I'm eating that. Why does this fish even have human teeth? How is this fish keeping their teeth so clean. I mean, their teeth is probably whiter than mine. And I'm a little bit freaked out right now, so let's let's move on. Unable to move in at number six. Have you guys ever heard of sleep paralysis? This phenomenon happens to millions of people. Sleep paralysis is when you're awake, but you can't move your body. 
This happens after you sleep. Most people just wake up. Well, for some people, their minds would wake up, but their bodies, are, it, it's, it's unable to move. I feel like sometimes I've felt this experience and it's really weird to last for seconds. You wake up in the morning and your body is just is really heavy and you just can't move it. Some situations are more severe where it takes people a very long time to gain the movement back and it's very scary and you're aware of everything around you. Okay, number five. Well, here's a fact for all you lefties out there and you know what, including myself. I have to say, I really don't believe in this fact, but there are studies done. Left-handed people die about nine years younger than right-handed people. I think this is a myth, but there was a research done on this that started in the late 80s to early 90s. Did you guys know that only 10% of people are left-handed? It means I'm unique, I'm special. So let me quickly list a few things why left-handed people might die earlier. Most things are not meant for lefties, which could be very dangerous. There was a study that showed left-handed people get into more accidents. Left-handed people are most likely to go insane. And all right, I don't want to get depressed right now because I'm in the minority and I'm going to die sooner than you guys are, you righties out there. So let's move on to number four. Okay, so we can all agree that doctor saves lives, right? Well, what if I told you your doctor could actually be the reason why you got very sick or even died? This is because doctors are known to have a very sloppy handwriting. I don't know why it is, but they're just, the, they're, they're terrible at writing. And this is just fact. Well, sloppy handwriting has contributed to more than 7,000 deaths a year. Take a look at this note. What does this even say? A lot of times the wrong medicine or dosage is given just because they can't read what the doctor is saying. Since we're talking about death, let's continue in at number three. This might scare you guys a bit, but did you guys know that 93.5% of humans have died? This is almost the entire human race. Since the beginning of time, 108 billion people have died and alive today is only 7 billion people. Over 55 million people die every single year. This is an extremely high number. I think that death is one of the most scariest things in life and all of these facts about it just freaks me out. Well, I'm about to get more freaked out with these last two facts. In at number two, experts believe Earth is long overdue for a massive asteroid or a massive object that's going to destroy Earth. Back in 2013, there was actually a massive meteor that hit Russia and it was actually captured on camera. Here it is. last massive asteroid that hit Earth was back 65 million years ago when a 15 kilometer wide asteroid slammed into Mexico starting a chain of events that left to the extinction of dinosaurs. An asteroid of that size hitting Earth is rare but it happens every 50 or 60 million years. So right now we're about 5 to 15 million years overdue. I really don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime anytime soon but it's scary to think about. So finally in a number one if a massive comet doesn't take out the Earth, well, it's going to be the Sun. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Every billion years, the Sun's brightness increases by about 10%. This is because the Sun is burning through hydrogen, which is insane to think about, that we have a giant star in the sky that is just constantly on fire. Well, if the Sun increased by 10%, this will make Earth uninhabitable, which means Stephen Hawking's last message to us would be correct. We need to find another planet to live on because Earth is going to be destroyed. We're not going to be able to sustain ourselves on here. Again, this is something that is just out of our control. Okay, so starting off this list, and at number 10, grocery stores treat packaged meat with carbon monoxide. I'm not making this stuff up. Yeah, so that colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas that is toxic, it is used to preserve our beloved chicken and beef when it is packaged and shipped to the grocery store. Obviously, our meat would spoil and go rotten rather quickly if it wasn't treated with some sort of preservative. But why the heck would they choose a poisonous and toxic gas? Apparently the carbon monoxide is good for preserving the meat's color and freshness and it allows these products to be sold for much longer than they should be. The American meat industry has been packaging meat with carbon monoxide since 2006 and there haven't been any negative reports. The FDA has classified carbon monoxide as um, generally safe. I mean, this sounds a little bit sketchy to me, but I can't resist a good steak, so I'm going to continue buying my packaged meat. Insects crawls onto this list. Oh, I hate insects and uh, they're gonna freak 
Lucas uh, in a number nine. And, and uh, I hate to break it to you, but we eat insects every day. I know a lot of you guys know this, but some of you didn't, and you're welcome for freaking you out now. I guess if you intentionally eat insects, then you're not too worried about this. But for someone like me, this is a pretty scary fact. Although I appreciate the extra protein I get on a daily basis from these insects, I would rather not be eating them. According to the FDA, they have allowances for the number of insects that have legally allowed to turn up in your food. I mean, how is this even possible? So yeah, basically you're eating these gross bugs and insects every single day. And actually the average person eats up to 430 insects a year, which works out to be about 1.2 bugs a day. And you know what? I'll probably be fine if they're just tiny ants, if I have to choose any bug, but I'd be freaking out knowing that I'm eating like a maggot or something. I think something should be done about this. I mean, it's 2018. Don't we have the technology to not have bugs in our food? And am I the only one grossed out about this? Next up, number eight, we have sleeping. Did you know that your mind can sense someone staring at you even when you're asleep? This is like an extra sense. That's why you randomly wake up during the night when someone is looking at you. This is a weird ability to have, but I'm actually really thankful for it. Because if a stranger broke into my house and watched me sleep, I'd want to know about it. I don't know what I would do about it, but I'd want to know about it. I bet you Nicolas Cage was happy that the mind is able to do this because one night he randomly woke up to a stranger standing over his bed the person was naked and they were eating a fudgicle imagine if you didn't wake up what other weird food would the stranger be eating okay all, all jokes aside I really find this really interesting and creepy all at the same time. It's like one big fusion. Ballpoint pens are in at number seven. I know what you're thinking. What's so scary about a ballpoint pen? Well, I was under the impression that the only scary thing that they can do is either explode in your pocket or your teacher might use one to write you a bad grade. But in reality, an average of 100 people actually choke to death on ballpoint pens every single year. I mean, you have to ask yourself one thing. Is this real life right now? I think that we might need to outlaw ballpoint pens. This is actually so messed up when you think about it. Another scary fact about ballpoint pens is that if you Google ballpoint pens, there is literally an article about a hundred ways that you can use to kill a person with a ballpoint pen. I'm not even kidding here. And you know what? I'm going to teach you guys a few techniques because why not? Well, one technique is just to, just to stab someone with a ballpoint pen, but I guess you can do it with any object. It doesn't have to be a ballpoint pen. And also you can use a ballpoint pen to um, sign away for a hitman to kill someone. So there are many ways you can kill someone using a ballpoint pen. But with any object, you can kind of make up a thousand ways to kill someone with. Okay, so what's in your belly button? I, I don't know what's in my belly button. A lot of lint or something? Well, this comes into number six. This fact is actually pretty disturbing. So brace yourselves here. Are you guys aware that there is a full-on ecosystem in your belly button right now? I don't know about you guys, but I'm about to pump a full bottle of hand sanitizer and just rub it all over my belly button. And you guys are probably gonna wanna do the same thing after you hear this. So back in 2012, scientists have found 1,458 new species of bacteria living in your belly button. That's over 1,400 new species of bacteria, which is absolutely insane. Apparently your belly button is just as unique as your fingerprints because each person has a very different bacteria living in their belly button. There was even one person who volunteered to have their belly button swabbed and it was discovered that her belly button contained a strain of bacteria that had previously only been found in soil from Japan and this person has never ever been to Japan. So after hearing this, I'm gonna make sure I wash my belly button a little bit better. I'm not even sure how much like attention or how much time I spend washing my belly button. But now I'm gonna take a conscious note of it. Your beloved cell phone drops into this list at number five. People generally clean their homes once a week or do a deep clean twice a month. We disinfect our kitchen counters, clean our carpets and make sure to scrub our toilets. But how often do we clean our phone? Well, I have an answer for that. I've never cleaned my phone. Like, what are you talking about cleaning your phone? Well, you're probably not cleaning it as much as you should. Or if you're like me, like I just submitted, I don't clean my phone. Well, you know what? After doing the research for this video, I'm going to make sure I scrub my phone with soap and with water and just rinse it. Hopefully my phone is still working after, but at least it won't be dirty. Well, according to multiple studies, your cell phone is 10 times dirtier than a public toilet seat. Those things are disgusting. Disgusting. There's absolutely no way. And it gets worse. 92% of phones have bacteria on them with 16% containing E. coli bacteria, which is commonly found in feces. 
pretty gross. <laughs> These bacteria can easily lead to infections if you're not careful. The influenza virus and the scary MRSA bacteria are also found on phones, which can also cause really severe rashes and also skin infections. So how often do you clean your phone and get rid of these nasty bacteria? Let me know in the comment section below. You're supposed to fill a spray bottle with diluted alcohol and lightly spray it into a microfiber cloth and gently wipe the phone down and the screen and you know the case. Don't ever spray the solution directly onto the phone or else it will probably get ruined. Okay, th that's enough with cell phones. Let's move on. The end of the world explodes in at number four. Were you guys aware that the world almost ended in 2017? I, I don't know. The world almost ends every year. <laughs> well, okay, the world didn't almost come to an end, but lots of people could have been killed and cities could have been destroyed beyond repair. And that's because in 2017, a 100 foot asteroid nicknamed AG 13 passed by Earth. This huge asteroid was approximately the same distance as the moon and it just nearly missed our planet. Scientists claim that they only saw this deadly asteroid roughly 24 hours before it would have hit Earth. Um, I mean, hello, NASA. What are you guys doing? I thought you guys were experts there. You guys only found out 24 hours hours before our doom. So I guess the lesson here is we'll never know if an asteroid is going to hit Earth until it's too late. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be informed if something is going to happen because I can prepare like a great last meal or something like that. Okay, sneezing makes its way onto this list at number three. Have you guys ever tried to suppress a sneeze? Sometimes I like to try to stop my body from sneezing because I'm in a quiet room or I just don't want to deal with the after effect. You guys know what I mean. But did you guys know that if you try to suppress a sneeze, you can rupture a blood vessel in your head or neck and you can even die. It's very rare, but you can even die. The pressure trapped in your head can be extremely dangerous and if you don't die, it can cause a lot of other problems too. Your ears can be at risk, causing your eardrums to rupture, which can cause to permanent hearing loss. So the moral of the story, kids, is uh, never hold your sneeze in. Just let it out. Morbid Recordings comes onto the scary list in at number one. This fact is actually pretty messed up and I'm definitely not brave enough to go to this website. Okay, so for the website, for you guys who are brave enough and want to hear the last words of people before death, you guys can. You guys can head over to planecrashinfo.com and what you're about to listen to are the voices of people screaming for help in their last few minutes of life on Earth. And I warned you, it gets pretty morbid. It's, it's pretty freaky. It's pretty scary. It's intense to say the least. Imagine going down in a plane crash and your voice, you're able to get your last message out there. Me, myself, I couldn't really listen to the tracks because like I said, it gets pretty intense. And I literally don't know why a website like this even exists, but there are a lot of disturbing things here on the internet. And we're gonna start off with Issei Sagawa. This was a notorious Japanese criminal who is known for taking lives and consuming human flesh. He's known for ending the life of Rene Hartvelt in Paris in 1981. In 83, he was deemed unfit for trial by French medical experts and was initially held in a psychiatric institution before being deported to Japan in 1984. But upon his arrival, he was ruled sane by Japanese authorities who decided his only problem was a character anomaly than that he did not require hospitalization. Yeah, eating people, just a little character quirk, you know? Now, unfortunately, Japanese authorities were unable to get his case files from their French counterparts, who considered the case closed, leaving Issei to walk free. Now, he made no secret of his crime and capitalized on it as he wrote a memoir entitled In the Fog, where he reminisced about the crime in vivid detail. Despite the heinous details of the homicide and his lack of remorse, Issei gained a level of celebrity and regularly gave interviews to domestic and international media in the years after his return. He displayed no apparent sign of remorse or a form telling Vice in a 2013 interview as he looked at posters of Japanese women. I think they would taste delicious. Yeah, thankfully he died of pneumonia in November of 2022 and can't hurt or profit off anyone ever again. Next up, we have Angela Simpson. In 2009, Angela Simpson lured Terry Neely to her home with the promise of fun bedtime activities and illicit substances. Once inside the home though, things took a very dark turn. Angela tormented the man for over three days, 
during which time she pulled the man's teeth out of his mouth and drove a nail into his head. And even more disturbing, she did all of this while Terry was seated in front of a mirror, so he was forced to watch all this play out. On the final day of the ordeal, Angela strangled and stabbed the man more than 50 times before dismembering his body and setting his remains on fire. In April of 2012, Judge Paul McCurdy sentenced Angela to natural life in prison, plus 14 years for the homicide. The additional 14 years were given to Angela for convictions of abandonment of a body and kidnapping. During a prison interview after her sentencing, she was asked if she had any regrets. She replied that she only regretted that she did not make the torment last longer. Her exact words were, not at all, why would I be? During the interview, Angela said that Terry bragged to her about the number of people he'd put in jail by snitching, but the Phoenix Police Department had no record of Terry ever being an informant or telling on anyone. Still, Angela remained insistent that he was a snitch and that he got what he deserved. She also expressed that she was upset that she wasn't able to end the lives of any more snitches. Next up, we have Empress Wu. Empress Wu of China was on the throne from 690 to 705, and she was the only woman in China's history to have absolute rule. But she's not remembered in the best light. She was a cruel, merciless empress who enjoyed tormenting and ending the lives of others. Chinese history paints Empress Wu as a demonic woman who connived her way to power through homicide and deceit. In fact, historians at the time claimed that she, quote, killed her sister, butchered her elder brothers, murdered the ruler, and poisoned her mother. She is hated by gods and men alike. She's believed to have ended the lives of thousands of people. Her reign came to an end in a coup in 704. Members of her court forced her to yield power to her exiled son, Zong Zong. In 705, she was in poor health and died. Her memorial tablet, which she had commissioned when she was an empress, was left purposefully blank so future historians could compose an epitaph detailing her accomplishments, but over a thousand years later, it still remains blank, her legacy completely unwritten. David Parker Ray. Uh, so this guy uh, was a kidnapper, a tormentor, and suspected serial slayer, though no bodies were ever found. David was accused by his accomplices of ending the lives of several women and was suspected by the police to have ended the lives of as many as 60 women from Arizona and New Mexico while living in Elephant Butte, New Mexico. David was then convicted of kidnapping and torment in 2001. After his arrest, the police quickly obtained a warrant to search his home and trailer. What the authorities found inside the trailer shocked and disturbed them. He called the place his toy box. It contained a gynecologist type table in the middle with a mirror mounted to the ceiling so that his victims could see the horrors delivered on them. Littering the floor were whips, chains, pulleys, straps, clamps, leg spreader bars, surgical blades, and saws. They also found diagrams on the walls showing different methods of inflicting pain. He would even play like tapes telling these women what he was about to do to them once they were kidnapped. I've heard it, it's really disturbing. He died of a heart attack about one year after his convictions in two cases, the second of which resulted in a plea deal. Next up is Bella Kiss. This was a Hungarian serial slayer who lived in the beginning of the 20th century. In 1903, Bella began plotting his horrific crimes. He would place personal ads in newspapers claiming to be a lonely widower looking for marriage under the Elias Hoffman. He would use this method to correspond with women and managed to convince some of them to give him their money and assets. Then he would lure them to his house so he could strangle them to death with rope or even his bare hands. Now, not only was that disturbing, but Bella sought to preserve the bodies of his victims. Specifically, he would pickle his victims' bodies in large steel drums filled with wood alcohol, methanol, and also drain the blood from the necks of his victims, earning him the nickname the Vampire of Sincata. He ended the lives of approximately 24 women. Tamerlane the Great. So this 14th century conqueror of Western, Central, and South Asia was known as Timur, and he considered himself to be a descendant of Genghis Khan. He 
took a lot of pride in it, which kind of tells you a lot about him. He was one of the most horrifying rulers in history, his rule being followed by cruelty and terror, which was responsible for destroying millions of people. He had various ways he would end people's lives, like forcing people to jump from cliffs and mountains, or getting up close and personal and just lobbing off their heads. He was also the one to order thousands of people to die of slow suffocation. He also enjoyed making towers out of human skulls. An estimated 15 to 20 million people died thanks to this lovely man. I'd also like to make a tower out of human skulls, just as long as like I didn't, you know, I wasn't responsible for their deaths. If I just found a bunch of skulls, I'd make a tower out of it, sure. In 1969, Donald Henry Gaskins began ending the lives of a series of hitchhikers he picked up while driving around the coastal highways of the American South. He would then torment and mutilate his victims. He claimed to have ended the lives of 80 to 90 people, and he was arrested in 1975. When a criminal associate confessed to police that he'd witnessed Donald ending the life of two young men, he was convicted of eight homicides and was sentenced to death was later commuted to life imprisonment without parole. Now in prison, Donald committed another homicide by ending the life of another prisoner. He's the only man to have ever ended the life of an inmate on death row. Next up, we have Dennis Nilsson. So many people call this guy the British Jeffrey Dahmer. Kind of gives you an idea of what we're working with here. This has to be one of the creepiest criminal cases that I've ever heard in recent history. Uh, when I first heard about what this guy did, uh, there was a lot of tossing and turning in bed that night. So, Nilsson ended the lives of 15 gay men in London between 78 and 83. He'd keep the bodies around for a while, propping them up and posing them around like life-size dolls before hiding them in the floorboards and eventually flushing the remains down the toilet when they'd become a little too gnarly to keep around. Yeah, you'd flush them down the toilet. So not only was this guy completely deranged, but also incredibly stupid. Folks in the building started complaining about this awful smell and yeah, uh, human flesh was discovered in his sewage system. Dennis claimed he went into a trance and on seven occasions actually freed the men rather than ending their lives because he was able to snap out of it. But the majority of his victims weren't so lucky. At one point, Dennis was rapidly running out of storage space with half a dozen bodies hidden around his apartment. He was forced to spray his rooms twice a day to try and get rid of the flies that were hatching from the decomposing bodies. When neighbors complained about the smell, he convinced them uh, they stemmed from structural problems with the building. Dennis was convicted in 83 of six counts of homicide with two attempted homicides and was sentenced to life in prison. Still imprisoned at full Sutton Maximum Security Prison in Yorkshire, England without the chance of release. Emperor Domitian was the last Roman emperor of the Flavian dynasty and he ruled the empire for 15 years following the death of his brother Titus in 81 AD. Domitian didn't really care about his citizens at all. He was a self-indulgent man with a thirst for violence. He spent much of his time committing adultery with prostitutes and he was also addicted to watching gladiatorial fights between women and dwarfs. But Domitian is best known for his reign of terror. After taking power away from the Senate, he became increasingly paranoid about the upper classes of Rome as he suspected them of plotting against him. Domitian oversaw the death sentences of philosophers, senators, imperial officers, and intellectuals. He even sentenced his own cousin to death at one point. How nice. Now, since he was so paranoid, he wanted his spies to show no mercy. Under the emperor's instructions, they would chop off hands and burn genitalia in order to extract as much information as possible from their prisoners. After three years of slaughter, Domitian died at the hands of a Praetorian guard, and the senators of Rome did their utmost to erase his name from history. And finally, we have Pedro Rodriguez Filho. Pedro Rodriguez Filho is a Brazilian serial slayer. He was arrested in 1973 and was later convicted in 2003 for ending the lives of at least 71 people and sentenced to 128 years in prison. Committing his first homicide at the age of 14, Pedro began a series of burglaries and carried out a death spree against local criminals. By the age of 18, he'd ended the lives of 10 people. While in prison, he took the life of his own father, who was also serving time for homicide. Pedro even went on to end the lives of at least 47 inmates 
while in prison. His continued spree led to further convictions, increasing his sentence to 400 years. But he was later released from prison in 2007, after serving 34 years. Then he was rearrested in 2011. Following his second release in 2018, he started a YouTube channel called Petrohino X Matador, commenting on modern crimes, campaigning against gang violence, and teaching the public not to be proud of criminal acts. But on March 5th of 2023, he was shot and died of his injuries. We're going to start off the list with the Springfield Three. So it's June of 1992, and two friends, Stacy McCall and Susie Streeter, have just graduated high school. They go to their graduation party and leave at around 2.15 a.m. Their plan is to spend the night at another friend's place, Jane Kirby, and then go to a water park the next day. But Jane's place was too crowded, so they decided to sleep at Susie's mom's place. The next day, Jane and her boyfriend headed to the water park as planned. They waited around for a bit, but no sign of Susie or Stacy. Eventually, they went over to the house to see what they were up to. They knocked, no answer, knocked again, nothing. They didn't seem to be home, but the door was unlocked and all of their cars were parked outside. A few hours go by and then Stacy's mom, Janice, comes over to investigate. They all entered the home to discover that, yeah, there was nobody home, even stranger even stranger than their car still being outside, though all of their purses were still home. Even Susie and her mom Cheryl's cigarettes were still there. On top of that, there was no sign of a struggle. It was as if they just vanished into thin air. And with no leads, there wasn't much anyone could do but aimlessly search around. Until this day, the case is still a complete mystery. Next on the list is Mr. Cruel. So this case is incredibly creepy. From 1987 to 1990, there were three attacks made by a still unknown assailant in Melbourne, Australia. He wore a balaclava, so victims were never able to get a good look at his face. All we have to go off is this unsettling police sketch. The media soon dubbed him Mr. Cruel, and the name really fits. This guy broke into three family homes with the entire families present and would torment them. He'd tie the parents up and cut the phone lines before abducting the youngest of the family. You can only imagine the despicable things. You can only imagine the despicable things this guy did after that. Now, fortunately, his three victims would eventually be released, but Mr. Cruel was never found or even identified. All right, the Tylenol case. This incredibly disturbing case happened in 1992 in Chicago. Someone tampered with Tylenol bottles, lacing them with potassium cyanide. A young girl died first after taking an extra strength Tylenol. Then the next day, three members of a single family all died after consuming Tylenol from the same bottle. On top of that, three separate people also died that day after taking Tylenol. When it was discovered that the Janices had died as a result of Tylenol, laced with three times the fatal amount of cyanide, a press conference was held advising people not to take Tylenol for the time being. Eventually, this led to the product being pulled, like loads of product from the shelves, and it was uh, recalled nationwide eventually. Now we have things like pull stickers on bottles because of incidents just like this. The case really falls into that category of crime I've always found deeply unsettling. Like, I mean, everything on this list is very disturbing, but the idea you could just walk into a drugstore and buy something off the shelf completely unaware that it's been poisoned by some unknown creep with a sick thrill of harming other people completely at random, absolutely nightmarish. Next up, we have the case of Russell and Shirley Dermond. Russell and Shirley were an elderly couple living in Putnam County, Georgia. They lived in a very quiet, safe neighborhood. Nothing bad ever happened there. But sometime between May 1st of 2014, when they were last known to be alive, and May 4th, when they failed to show up to an event they'd planned to attend with their neighbors, the couple met a grisly end. One neighbor, growing concerned, decided to check on them. He knocked on their door and got no answer, but the door was unlocked. He eventually made a horrific discovery. Russell's decapitated body was lying in the garage, but Shirley was nowhere to be found. It wasn't until 10 days later that Shirley's body was found in a lake about five miles from the home. 
She'd suffered blunt force trauma to the head. And sadly, the case was a total dead end. There were no witnesses, no evidence of a motive behind the attack, let alone a suspect. So the case remains unsolved to this day. Russell's head hasn't even been found. Next, we have the mysterious death of Robert Wan. So this is a very, very strange case. So on the night of August 2nd of 2006, Wan, who is a lawyer, was staying at the home of three friends, Joseph Prince, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward in Washington, DC. That night, he was supposed to sleep in a guest room, but he was found dead in the room from stab wounds. The three housemates called the police, claiming that an unknown intruder must have entered the house, but investigators found little evidence of any forced entry, and even stranger, there were no signs of a struggle, like as if one hadn't tried to defend himself at all. This meant he was likely incapacitated with a paralyzing agent before being stabbed. The other strange part was the, the lack of blood. There was none. There wasn't even any coming out of his wounds. It was such an oddly clean crime scene. Suspicion fell on Price, Zaborski, and Ward. They were later charged with obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and tampering with evidence. As it seemed, they were not fully cooperating with the investigation. And during the trial, the defense maintained their innocence though, arguing that Juan's death was indeed caused by some unknown intruder. In 2010, the three housemates were acquitted of the criminal charges. The judge noted that the prosecution had failed to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that's a pretty infuriating way for the case to end because obviously these three housemates had something to do with Juan's death, uh, but what was the motive? That's the question. Next is the case of the Setagaya family. On the night of December 30th, 2000, in the Setagaya ward of Tokyo, the Miyazawa family, composed of Mikio Miyazawa, his wife Yasuko Miyazawa, their daughter Nina, and son Ray, died in their own home at the hands of an unknown assailant. The crime was discovered on New Year's Day when a neighbor noticed bloodstains in the window of the Miyazawa residence and contacted the police. Authorities would find the lifeless bodies of the Miyazawa family and it had been a pretty gruesome scene. All four family members had been bound, beaten, and stabbed to death. And the assailant stuck around for a while after committing the act. He ate some of their food, he cruised the internet for a bit, and left without taking any valuable items. Whoever this person was, they're still out there, unless they've died since. And it's frustrating because there was so much evidence at the scene. There was DNA and fingerprints everywhere, but somehow the perpetrator has never been identified. All right, the Brandon Swanson case. This is yet again a completely baffling case. In southwestern Minnesota in May of 2008, Brandon Swanson, a college student, suddenly went missing. On the night of May 14th, Brandon was driving home from a party. At some point, he got lost and then got his car stuck in a ditch. He phoned up his father, trying to give him his whereabouts. His parents drove to his whereabouts and tried flashing their headlights, but Brandon said he didn't see them. So he told his dad, you know what, I'm just gonna walk to a nearby town to get some help. He could see lights in the distance that he believed was the nearby town of Lind. Dad then stayed on the phone with him as he walked towards the town. At some point during the call though, Brandon suddenly exclaimed, oh sh, and then went silent. They tried to call Brandon again, thinking the call had just disconnected, but they couldn't reach him. He's, he hasn't been seen or heard from since. Next, we have the Florence Salon case. On a cool November morning in 2001 in Florence, Montana, a customer arrived at the Hair Gallery Salon for a scheduled appointment. What they found was the scene of a deadly crime. Three women were dead, including Dorothy Harris, the owner of the salon, Brenda Patch, a manicurist, and Cynthia Paulus, a customer. Their throats had all been slit. Once again, there was nothing to go off here, no witnesses. No clear motive or suspect, just three innocent women whose lives were taken seemingly at complete random. The case of Laurie Deppies. Laurie Deppies, a 20-year-old woman, disappeared on August 19th of 1992 from Menasha, Wisconsin. On the night of her disappearance, Laurie had been working at a local photography studio and was last seen leaving her shift. 
She had plans to meet her boyfriend at his apartment later that evening, but never arrived. Well, she would made it into the parking lot, but never physically into the building. People inside the apartment heard her drive up, they heard her car door shut, but that was it. She never came in. Her car was found in the parking lot of the apartment complex. A styrofoam cup of soda was on top of it, but no sign of Lori. And she's never been found. I can't imagine how completely devastating this would be and confusing. Just awful. We always think of, you know, if my loved one is, heaven forbid, goes missing, they'll probably be when I'm not around. They'll probably be somewhere off alone. But the fact that she was right there, outside the apartment, like car in the parking lot, they heard her getting out of the car and then just poof, gone. That's has to be absolutely maddening. Finally though, we have the infamous Yuba County 5 case. This is one of the most mysterious cases in the United States. Five young men in Yuba County, California disappeared in 1978. Theodore Weir, Jack Hewitt, and Gary Mathias were a group of friends, all with intellectual disabilities of some kind. They disappeared after attending a college basketball game. After the game, the men were last seen at a convenience store. They had plans to return home to Yuba County, but they never made it back. Their abandoned car was later found in a remote and mountainous area called Plumas National Forest. The car was stuck in the snow and there was no sign of the men. It was determined that they'd walked away from the car, even though the weather was very harsh. In June of 1978, there was finally a breakthrough in the case. The remains of Ted were discovered in a trailer about 19 miles from where the car had been found. There was food and supplies in the trailer. Where it had seemingly died of starvation and exposure. This was very odd because the trailer was stocked with enough food to keep all five men alive for quite a while and there was stuff there to make fire and everything, but none of that had been used. Then Jack and Bill were found the following day, about 11 miles from the car. And all that was left of Bill were bones, and Jack looked to have been partially eaten by an animal. Jackie's remains were found two days later, and as for Gary, he was never found. So first off, we have the radioactive man. After a fateful accident in Japan's Tokamura nuclear power plant in 1999, worker Hisashi Uchi suffered immensely. When he arrived at the University of Tokyo Hospital after being exposed to the highest level of radiation of any human in history, doctors were stunned. The nuclear power plant technician had almost zero white blood cells and thus no immune system. Soon he'd be crying blood as his skin melted. Kept in a special radiation ward to protect him from hospital-born pathogens, the profuse amount of radiation coursing through his blood eradicated the introduced cells and skin grafts could not hold. I can't take it anymore, he cried out, but at his family's insistence, the doctors continued their experience experimental treatments even as his skin began to melt from his body. Then on the 59th day in the hospital, he had a heart attack. But his family agreed that he should be resuscitated in case of death, so the doctors revived him. He'd eventually have three heart attacks in one hour. It was only a merciful final cardiac arrest due to multi-organ failure on December 21st, 1999 that released him from the pain. Now this was 83 days after the incident. I can't imagine the pain he was in and why the doctors and his family kept trying to save him. Next up, we have green boots. Climbing Mount Everest is a very dangerous thing to do, and unfortunately, some people who have tried to do it have met their untimely death. As of November 2022, 310 people have died on Everest. Over 200 bodies remain on the mountain and have not been removed due to the dangerous conditions. Now, as morbid as it sounds, current climbers use these bodies as location markers, and Green Boots is one of them. Green Boots is named for the colored boot the climber was wearing, and he is a landmark on the main northeast ridge route of Mount Everest. The body has not been officially identified, but it is believed to be Swang Pajor, an Indian climber who died on Everest in 1996. All expeditions from the north side encountered the body curled in the limestone alcove cave at 27,900 feet until it was moved in 2014. Green Boots was moved to a less conspicuous location by members of a Chinese expedition. Now in 2006, British mountaineer David Sharp was found in a hypothermic state in Green Boots Cave by climber Mark Ingalls and his party. Mark continued to ascend after radioing for advice on how to help David, 
which he was unable to provide. Now, David died of extreme cold some hours later. Approximately three dozen other climbers would have passed by the dying man that day, and it had been suggested that those who noticed him mistook him for green boots and therefore paid little attention. Overall, it's just super sad, but I don't know why people would risk their lives for this. Now we have the Victorian British Eight Mummies. Okay, so I've seen people talk about this before on Twitter, but I've never actually delved into this topic, and well, I think I should have left it that way. They first started with the Egyptian mummy, which was crumbled into a solution to stanch internal bleeding. But other parts of the body soon followed. Skull was one common ingredient taken in powdered form to cure head ailments. Even the moss that grew over a buried skull called usnea became a prized additive, powder believed to cure nosebleeds and possibly epilepsy. Human fat was used to treat the outside of the body, and doctors prescribed bandages soaked in it for wounds, and rubbing fat into the skin was considered to be a remedy for gout. Blood was procured as fresh as possible, while it was still thought to contain the vitality of the body, because yes, they used the blood for more remedies. Now, thankfully, the practice dwindled in the 18th century, around the time Europeans began regularly using forks for eating and soap for bathing, but all I gotta say is you. <laughs> Moving on to Carl Tanzler. I need to tell y'all about Carl Tanzler because he is just such a truly messed up man. In 1930, Carl believed he'd found his one true love. While working as a radiologist in Florida, he met a young Cuban-American woman, Maria Elena Magaro de Hoyas. She was suffering from tuberculosis and died the next year. Carl paid for her funeral and visited her malazeum regularly. He was obsessed with Maria. Now, in the dead of night in 1933, he took her body from the mausoleum and back to his home in a red wagon. He put her skeleton back together using coat hangers, stuffed her with rags, and made her a wig from her own hair. She was dressed and put in his bed until seven years later, following rumors of the destruction of her body, and he was discovered by police. While her body was covered with clothes, her face was a death mask of her former self, created by Carl, and was kept in his bed after the coroner had removed the rest of her body. Now, unbelievably, the statute of limitations had expired, and Carl's case was dismissed out of court, but yeah, there is just so much wrong with that, I am just speechless. <laughs> now we have the chainsaw invention. In 1780, two Scottish doctors invented the prototype of the chainsaw. Now this wasn't cutting down trees or anything, oh no. John Atkin and James Jeffrey invented the hand crank chainsaw to cut through the pelvises of delivering mothers who were having trouble pushing their babies out. And to make things worse, mothers were completely conscious throughout the entire process. Now that just hurts to think about. Now, those women were just so, so strong. Now, after seeing how well it worked out in the delivery room, well, that is according to the male doctors, the machine was then co-opted to saw through wood and other materials, gradually growing in size to become the chainsaw we know today. Now, thank God we've made more advancements when it comes to giving birth, because just, wow. <laughs> then there's the brain-eating parasite. Neglaria fowleri is a free-living amoeba that is so small that it can only be seen with a microscope. It is commonly found in warm, fresh water, such as lakes, rivers, and hot springs, and soil. Now, the parasite infects people when the water containing the amoeba enters the body through the nose. This typically happens when people go swimming, diving, or when they put their head under fresh water. The amoeba then travels up the nose to the brain, where it destroys the brain tissue and causes a devastating infection that is almost always fatal. Now, the first symptoms usually start about five days after infection, but they can start within one to 12 days. Symptoms may include headache, fever, nausea, or vomiting. Later symptoms can include stiff neck, confusion, lack of attention to people and surroundings, seizures, hallucinations, and coma. After symptoms start, the disease progresses rapidly and usually causes death within about five days, but the death can happen within one to 18 days. Yeah, remind me to never swim in fresh water again. The Highway of Tears. The Highway of Tears is a 447 mile long corridor of Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert in British Columbia, Canada, which has been the location of crimes against missing and dead Indigenous women. Accounts vary as to the exact number of victims, but according to the RC, 
UNP Project EPANA, the number of victims is fewer than 18, while indigenous organizations estimate that the number is higher than 40. In 2015, the federal government launched a national inquiry into the cases. That year, Carolyn Bennett, now a federal minister of Crown Indigenous Relations Canada, claimed that the national number of victims in Canada is likely over 1,200, which is just insane, and it's disgusting that no one really seems to care about these women and girls. Now, the region of the Highway of Tears is characterized by poverty and, until 2017, lacked adequate public transportation, which forced many locals to resort to hitchhiking as a form of transit. Now, this directly resulted in some of the deaths and disappearances. Some activists argue that institutional racism and sexism have affected the searches for these indigenous women, and we just need to put more resources into these disappearances. Now we have burn degrees. We've all heard of first, second, and third degree burns, right? Well, what if I told you there also existed fourth, fifth, and sixth degree burns? But wait, isn't third degree burns considered the worst? Apparently no. Fourth degree burns occur when heat damage destroys the dermis and muscle tissue is affected. Like third degree burns, fourth degree burns result in scarring and the loss of keratin, loss of hair shafts and fingernails and toenails. Fifth degree burns happen when all the skin and subcutaneous tissues are destroyed, exposing muscle. These burns can be fatal due to damage to major arteries and veins. Fifth degree burn injuries also may require amputation due to the damage to the muscles. Permanent and prominent scarring with the loss of keratin in the area of the burn will also occur. Sixth degree burns occur when the heat destroys the muscles, charring and exposing the bone. These bones are almost always fatal, and uh, just saying that gives me goosebumps. That's absolutely horrible. And while researching this topic, I made the right decision by not looking up any photos related to this, so be like me and please don't look at them. Up next, we have Richard Chase. Richard Chase was a disturbed man, and in 1976, he was involuntarily committed to a mental institution when he was taken to a hospital after injecting rabbit's blood into his veins. Now, while there, he broke the necks of two birds he caught and drank their blood. Chase was then diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and after undergoing treatments, he was deemed no longer a danger to society, and later that year, he was released into his mother's custody. But just a year later, he claimed the life of his first victim. Two weeks after the first death, he attempted to enter the home of a woman, but because her doors were locked, he walked away. Chase later told detectives that he took locked doors as a sign that he was not welcome, but unlocked doors were an invitation to come inside. Um... Sir? Okay. <laughs> now, he ended the lives of more people, eating their organs and other body parts, and drinking their blood. He eventually was caught and arrested, and police who searched his apartment found that the walls, floor, ceiling, refrigerator, and all of his eating and drinking utensils were soaked in blood. He was eventually found guilty of six counts of first-degree homicide, and the jury rejected the argument that he was not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced him to death. And lastly, we have the Lake Nao disaster. On August 21st, 1986, farmers living near Lake Neos heard rumbling. At the same time, a frothy spray shot hundreds of feet out of the lake, and a white cloud formed over the water. From the ground, the cloud grew 328 feet tall and flowed across the land. When farmers near the lake left their houses to investigate the noise, they lost consciousness. The heavy clouds sunk into the valley, and people in the affected areas collapsed. Over the next two days, people from the surrounding surrounding areas entered the valley to find the bodies of humans and cows lying on the ground. By August 23rd, the cloud had mostly blown away, and scientists soon learned that the cloud contained carbon dioxide, CO2. Now, when the CO2 concentration was 15% or less, people lost consciousness and later revived, but individuals who had inhaled more than 15% of CO2 stopped breathing within minutes and died. Scientists determined that the CO2 had been trapped at the bottom of Lake Nails for a long time and then erupted. Now, in the end, 1,746 people and 3,500 livestock died.